What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode 12 of No Labels Necessary. Let's get it. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Wednesday, on every place you listen to podcasts. And of course, here on YouTube, if you are watching in our original space, we are owners of Contra Brand Agency, music marketer found, uh, or, or organization, done a lot of dope stuff. But here, what are we here for? We just like to have fun talking music, business, culture, and that's what we're going to do today. So the first topic that I got to get into, Uh-oh. Jacora, you actually sent this one over. Uh-oh. It's not a bad one. We, are, we just giving <laughs> a little advice. You know, I like to kick it off with a little bit of advice from an artist by the name of Jaleel. So I'm going to play this clip and then we're going to talk because he's, he's, he's giving some game, in my opinion. I feel like in any way psychology kind of helped like your rap career? Like, are there any parallels, you think? Yeah, Jaleel is psychology. You know, what we're doing right now is psychology. Mm. Even me screaming, Jaleel, yeah. When I scream Jaleel, yeah, you might think of me ripping my shirt or me doing a backflip. Or yeah. you might just think of something like exciting, you know? Mm. So it's like all of it's psychology in a way so i i believe i applied it that's cool at least you learned something from school all right i want to get your thoughts first because to me he's giving game and i want to go deep on some psychology stuff that that he's talking about from like just some anecdotes that i know but yeah what, what, what made you even share this part i think the psychology aspect of marketing doesn't get talked about enough Okay. Right. Like we tend to just think of it as this thing happens, numbers pour in, pour out, whatever. But I don't think people think about the part that he was kind of touching on is like I'm I'm thinking about the way that people are going to kind of like react to this or receive this, which is psychology pretty much, right? Like you're 100%. thinking about like the user end experience of the funnel and applying it to top of funnel stuff that you're doing to get this desired outcome. But yeah, that's why I should have. I don't think I don't think enough artists think about that and i think he explained it in a way where at first i was like man i kind of feel like there's some like branding things getting confusing here with like maybe general marketing psychology i'm like well i guess it's the same thing pretty much you know what i'm saying like it they, they go hand in hand but <laughs> no he is deep into psychology man i'm yeah. gonna tell you why um so are you familiar with how toothpaste really hit the came in the game, and when I say came in the game, so toothpaste, toothpaste. No, I, don't, I don't think so, man. It All was right. just it was just kind of there. Well, every artist needs to understand <laughs> how toothpaste came in the game, and, and especially blew up in America. So, Pepsodent was one of the main leaders at the very beginning. You ever seen two, uh, Pepsodent toothpaste? Yeah, yeah. All right, shout out to them. No, no uh, advertising dollars, but you know maybe in the future because they are struggling these days. Pepsodent, um, there was a guy who who created that formula. He came over to this uh, marketing executive named Claude Hopkins, if I remember correctly. So obviously as a business marketing advertising executive, he's like, how can I sell this thing? And that's what he went to him for. He does some research and he notices something around mucin plaque, right? Mucin plaque is basically like just, just the film on your mouth, on your on your teeth, right? So okay. he shortened it to like the film and called it the film on your teeth. And what he did was create campaigns around toothpaste and beauty, right? So you have this mil- this plaque on your teeth, this film on your teeth. Oh, uh, how you going around looking all ugly with that film on your teeth? Why don't you mm, use some of this stuff mm, and now you're beautiful, right? Mm, yeah. All right. Yeah. So he he connected the dot where there's this specific trigger, the, the film on your teeth, getting rid of that. Now you can feel beautiful. And without it, you don't you don't feel beautiful. All right. Yeah. And you can literally feel that you're like touching it or all that stuff. You know, we all got teeth here. All right. <laughs> so like that trigger right there reminds me of what Jalil was talking about. This goes deeper, by the way. I'm, I'm gonna get to the other parts, but like uh, Jaleel is literally talking about, when I say Jaleel, yeah, right? Like, you see a picture. He went straight to imagery. Like, what do you see when this specific thing happens, right? So when he says Jaleel, yeah, if maybe there was a moment that you have because you the first time you heard it, he was in a, uh, it was a show and he did something crazy to it. Or, you know, it was a song, but it puts you in a, a certain zone right yeah. it probably makes you feel a certain way whenever you say jaleel yeah yourself or when you hear it yeah right? yeah you yeah. know so like that is that psychology 
I don't want to say one on one, but it's one of those <laughs> those levels to it, and it's extremely power powerful triggers and associating things with those specific triggers is huge. So on the other tip, there's um Wolfram Wolfram Schultz. That's his name. It's a doctor. Right? He's a neuroscientist to be specific, and he did these tests on, I think it was a rat. Maybe I, I, I might have the animal wrong. But he did this test on an animal where they would be in a dark room, flashing uh, shapes on a screen, right? And whenever the, the shapes flash, he would have to pull this lever, right? So there's that trigger, right? You see these colorful shapes, you pull the lever. Mm. Okay, whatever, you just pull the lever. But why is that so powerful? Well, that part's not powerful by itself. You're just telling him to do that. But what was happening Every single time that um, that happens and he pulls that lever, all of a sudden there was this tube, like a straw coming in, and it would feed him some blackberry juice. Okay. All right? So now he's getting a reward system because he sees these shapes, and the shapes don't just mean, oh, I pull the lever. Me seeing the shapes and pulling the lever now means, oh, shit, I get rewarded for this, right? Yeah, yeah. So that right there, again... It's a trigger. Something happens, you see something, you visually see something. Now he gets excited every time he sees these shapes because he knows it means I pull this thing and then I'm going to get a reward, which is crazy. You're like, man, you're messing with the animals, man. Like, hey, the flip side of it was <laughs> after he got used to that, they would start like staggering the delivery of the blackberry juice. So at first, every single time he pulled that trigger, bam, here it goes. Next time, Though he pulls a trigger, it doesn't come. Next time, it does come. Next time, it doesn't come. That time after that, it might be diluted a little bit. So it's like that same juice, but it's diluted. Don't taste, hit the quite exact same. The other time, it might be a little bit more bitter. So it's this inconsistency, and he's developing a craving now because he's looking for that high yeah. of the first time. Yeah. So the trigger becomes even stronger, but and he and he um kind of became like desperate you know, depressed a little bit because he's not getting it. It's funny. It's like, dang, I can see how that works in our in my own experience, right? You get those triggers. It's even like looking through TV or, or scrolling through Spotify, right? It's like, let's say I'm just scrolling through Spotify. I land on a nice little playlist or whatever, got a couple songs and my reward system is there. I got what I want. Next thing you know, I'm now trying to search for something I want. And then that shit's inconsistent. It's like, oh, that song was good. Next song was bad. Dang, I gotta go find another song. Yeah, and then you start craving yeah. to just hear a good song and not have to touch anything anymore. You're like, you tra- you're craving that moment, right? Yeah. So, like that, those triggers on both sides, right? The positive to do something and the the negative of like feeling the craving. That's all cravings are. It's almost like it's like the negative side of a trigger. Now bringing it full circle. I'll say no. Bring it semicircle back to Two Face, and then full circle to to, uh, to Jalil. So there was another thing with Pepsi. So Pepsi Pepsi didn't took off on them. All right, their Two Face was killing the game, and it took about about a decade where all of a sudden these Two Face competitors said, "Yo, we got to figure this shit out. Like, we got to research, figure out why these guys are killing us so much." Yeah, they were a little bit familiar with the marketing campaign, but it still wasn't letting them hit like Pepsi was. So what they found was in the formula, there were a couple of things, all right? Citric acid, which is an organic compound and mint oil, right? We know that minty taste, right? Um, was was in there. Mint was not a common thing in all that shit before, in, in toothpaste before. It's now that mint is a common thing. So what they found was Citric acid and mint oil, or just mint in general, these things are naturally irritants. Why would somebody want to be irritated? Well, people aren't necessarily looking for irritation. However, people just started to associate that tingle that you feel when you brush your tooth, toothpaste, your, your teeth, as clean. Mm-hmm. So you get used to it. Now, have you ever used? It's funny. I was using my uh, my daughter's toothpaste because my wife was sleeping. I was like, I ain't about to go in the room and get all like bothered again right like i'm bothering her so i'm gonna use this little tom's organic toothpaste mm-hmm. 
That shit ha- didn't have. It ain't got no sizzle. It didn't have no sizzle, <laughs> and I really didn't feel like my teeth were clean. And it was funny because that was the first time I've I've known like about that. Like the, it, they talk about it in um this book called Habits by Charles Duhigg, and I known about it, but that was my first time since hearing that actually brushing my teeth <laughs> and like dang okay I can see how I don't have a reward system. Yeah. So they literally changed the whole landscape of America just by literally adding. So a little bit of mint, adding a little like irritant, or like, as you giving call people it, a, sen- a sensation, like a, giving a, them a, a feeling. sensation, yeah. giving them a feeling, and that's what Jalil is talking about right there. He didn't go that deep into it, but Jalil, it sounded like he talked about some other things, but he's very aware, right? When I do something or when I say something specific, I can put people in a place, yeah, right, take them there or give them a feeling, and the more you can implement stuff like that into your brand. Right. It's probably why sometimes people are like, man, Sean, bring the bow back. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, probably not, you know, <laughs> but, you know, if I do, it'll be very intentional. But I understand it puts people in a specific space and gets them into this uh, zone of expectation. Yeah. I just like knowing that he's even aware of it. Because, you know, that, there are times where you see artists doing things like that really well. Yeah. And you can't tell if they're doing it intentionally or if it's on accident. Right. You know, and like, it's crazy, but there are some artists out there who, are very successful on accident. Like they don't really under oh, they don't really understand like why it's clicking for them, no way it's clicking for them or what they represent to their audience. Mm-hmm. But then someone on the outside is like, no, nah, I see it very clearly. Like you represent angst or you represent freedom or whatever, right? Yep. So I it, it's just it's refreshing to kind of just see that there's an artist out there who's aware aware and is probably making decisions to to kind of enhance that. Cause now I think about his overall, let's say, um, personality and the way he's out there. Mm-hmm. Right, like if you're familiar with Jalil, he's like, he's almost like the friendly giant. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, <laughs> like this guy that looks like he could hurt you, but probably wouldn't hurt you. You know what I'm saying? Very chill, down to earth guy. A lot of his like early TikTok videos and even things that he do, he does now are like very out there. And I'm thinking about what, what he's saying um, about you know the psychology of paying this experience for the artist and then kind of what you're saying. And now it makes me think like, man, is this shit on purpose? Right? Like he knows, hey, I'm this bigger person. People would probably, you know, more often than not be afraid of me or have feel some type of way about me. I'm going to be extreme to one end on the Internet. You know what I'm saying? And then maybe in like in real life, be like the complete opposite. So the juxtaposition of that is interesting to you. Right. Bruh, I bet you he is. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Because I was that dude at one point. <laughs> and I had a, a funny enough, of like a boss. I used to work at a spot called Tinder. I mean, he was that way, too. It was this big white guy, a lot taller than me. And. And he was like, like fat big, but we both had the same thing because we were talking about it. For whatever reason, people used to look at me as I was a little bit more intimidating, maybe because I was, <laughs> you know, even more muscular, and I probably didn't have the happiest face on. So I would put on my glasses just to like make the myself, tone it down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, to tone it down. I just know, <laughs> I just noticed people looked at me a little bit differently if I toned it down. I, was like, I ain't trying to come around like a threat, you know what I mean? Especially I was, I was moving in a. In a lot of circles where I, you know, that were that were less black at that time, I was like, let me let me let these people feel a little <laughs> safer. <laughs> let me put these glasses on. So you you saying like he's tall and big and the way he looks and all that stuff, bro? I bet he's aware to it to, to some extent for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be especially at, at this point, bro. Like, there's, there's no way he hasn't heard mm-hmm. it because it's, it's a big drop point. That's one of the first things that made me pay attention to him was you know him like ripping the shirt off and like flipping off of stages and. Doing these, these, you know, these like kind of like wild antics on the internet, like, and it was crazy because it was like it was wild. There was like shock value there to it, but it wasn't like the traditional rap shock value. You know what I'm saying? Well, you can tell like they're kind of going like super overboard. It's just like oh, like he ripped the t-shirt, so it's this really, you know, what I'm saying like swole guy making. I mean, I would say his music is probably like hyper pop. You know what I'm saying? Rap. So he's doing like the whole high pitched voice thing, mm-hmm. and then you see him, and you're like, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? But yeah, it's like at this point. <laughs> He has to 100%. I would think he's 100% aware of it, and he's playing into it because he's thinking about the psychology of it. Like, how are people going to kind of perceive this, uh, right? Like, the way I kind of set them up with my intro character all the way down to they hear the music. Like, I'm thinking about, like, how are they going to perceive me throughout yeah. this entire experience? And is yeah. that going to give you an impression? Because if he was, like, I don't know, let's say, like, a hood rapper, I don't think it would hit the same because we're, we're used to, you know what I'm saying, like the big scary people over there, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it doesn't That's it doesn't true. hit the same in that genre. It's like, here's a, this guy that maybe looks like he could be, you know what I'm saying, one type of genre, but he embodies another type. 
something I'm not used to seeing in that space or seeing from someone that looks like him in that space. Like, that's interesting to me. You know what I'm saying? See, when you say, like, the non-traditional, because I didn't know where you are going with it, the non-traditional, like, raps shock value, mm. I didn't know where you were going with it, but then when you talked about it and say ripping off his shirt and things like that, it really just brought me to imagery. Mm -hmm. And whether he's aware of it or not, the psychology of it is is very clear, right? That imagery, very specific imagery that's strong enough to stand out. It doesn't have to be over the top and create extra conversation and do these things, but just mm -hmm. to stand out, that imagery is so meaningful. X was really good at imagery. Like uh, whether it was something like straight up visual or more creating a visual in his head or a story or just doing something. Yeah, we could call it semi outlandish. And I, I feel like I remember him seeing interviews where he was pretty aware of it. But you can constantly create these images for people to latch on to, right? You look at Kanye reinventing himself album after album a lot more drastically in the earlier years. Now, you know, he's been pretty steady image wise overall, but you know, the the kid with the backpack and the polos to mm -hmm. the, the the mohawk or faux hawk, whatever that was, mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. glasses and all that stuff. Like the glasses stood out, you know, Michael Jackson type stuff, like very specific images, the glove and all that stuff. And then what well, he went to probably like the chain and and baggier stuff late. Uh, what after was that? Right after um, 808's Heartbreak, Beautiful Dark, just twisted fantasy was after that, right? Yeah. What was his? I feel like his image was. More like yeah, heavy chains. It might have been the suit era. Yeah, he, he had a suit era. So. I'm trying to think because mm -hmm. at a waist, and so whatever after that was like almost suit him. That might have been in between albums though, because that wasn't a part of the actual album though. Yeah, right? I think what you're talking about, Baggy or him, might have been closer to um. I can't think of the name of that. the album. Album had like ultralight beam and all that stuff on it. Yeah, that was like a Pablo. Wait, no, I, no, no, no. Oh, okay, no. Nah, we're talking about two different things. Okay. Now, all right, that, that's baggy or baggy him. I don't really mean legit baggy, actually. Mm. It's, it was more that slightly baggy when, remember he wore the kilt and then like the yeah. leather uh, MC Hammer-ish type pants. Yeah. Like So like that kind of baggy, not like the, yeah, like the true like large fit he's doing right now. That... Whatever era that was. But anyway, like those are very specific images and evolutions of it. So Jalil is super, he seems to be super aware of it, but you initially brought up like, was he aware of it or not? Da, da, da. It's good to see that he is aware of it because there's some people who aren't, mm -hmm. but it's happening for him. And that's why a lot of times, especially in a creative space, marketing can be undervalued because there's so many people who are winning without knowing why they're winning. Yeah, exactly. They think, oh, this is just me. I'm being my, and maybe naturally you are just being, just like some people are naturally charismatic and they're doing a lot of things that scientifically help persuade people, even though they don't know that they're doing it. Yeah. You can very well as an artist, whatever the colors you choose or the the way you go about presenting your stuff, you, you just have that knack and that taste making. You don't know why. So then when someone breaks it down to a science, you might either recognize that a cool or say, oh no, I ain't do all that thinking or overthinking into it, but it's still there. The, the, it's true yeah. whether or not you know it or not. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I think that's part of the dis injustice or, dis or yeah, I I'll just go with injustice of some of these artists who do have it more naturally, making it seem like you, it can't be something that's learned or just because they didn't do it intentionally doesn't mean that the science of it isn't true. Because that keeps people who don't have that thing naturally from thinking that they can do the same thing. You know what I mean? And yeah. then they say, oh, well, that person doesn't think about marketing. Like, if, if Kanye truly didn't think about marketing, if he truly didn't think about marketing at all, because he, he acts like he said stuff like that before, all right? That doesn't mean this, this man ain't a great marketer, self-promoter, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, of course, he creates great product, but even that is part of marketing when you talk about the word of mouth that comes from great product. So... His natural self might be just a, a, a born marketer without even knowing it. So, but that kind of, saying the kind of stuff like that, a lot of artists end up, well, shoot, I don't need to promote myself. It's like, well, hey, bro, you kind of, you're not Kanye naturally. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, some of these things you need to, you need to be intentional about. Yeah. And thinking about. Yeah. And I, I think that's the, the best way to look at it is like, how can you, how can you bottle the superpower pretty much? You know mm. what I'm saying? Um, 
because that that becomes a the part of, of the the what am I trying to say? Like the the part about it with certain arts that, that kind of becomes alarming is like, man, sometimes you have this really great thing that is working for you, but you're not taking the time out to understand it. And, and like I said, like figure out how to ball the, the magic pretty much. Like, yes. And so I, I, to me, that goes back to just one of the big things we've always talked about, like community building and making sure you're talking to your fans and asking these people, like, why do you like me? You know what I'm saying? Like, like you need to be almost annoying about like, damn, what makes you fuck with me? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are you here? Like, oh, you like the music? You like the way I do certain things? Because yeah, you're right. If you're one of those people that are just kind of creatively going about things, you're not trying to put it into a, a, a scientific process, then yeah, that's, that's naturally going to happen. But once you see it working, like I do feel like you should be doing your best to understand why it's working exactly, right? Mm-hmm. Because in marketing, the game starts to become, or the, the first game is let me identify a person that even likes this shit, right? Like let me, let me try to visualize that person and then actualize that person. And then once you have an understanding of, hey, here's that one person out of the thousand I hit that likes this shit, now the game becomes how can I find more people like that person, right? Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying, and, true. And, and you have to now that means I have to understand this person. I have to understand why this person was attracted to me. What about like you said, my album art made them click on the ad I, I sent through? What about this video made them watch it 100 percent of the way versus this video they only watched it 10 percent of the way, right? Like you had, like once you have a a person in mind that likes it, the rest of the game is is like 80 percent psychology based. Hey man, that's <laughs> that right there. The videos is a good example because when you don't seek to understand, mm-hmm. that's when sometimes you get beside yourself without knowing. You think, oh yeah, they just like me because it's me and I can drop whatever, mm-hmm. all right? And then all of a sudden, you used to a hundred thousand views per video, and then you drop another video that that shit only do five thousand. You like, what happened? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, because you didn't understand. But if you understood, you would have kept some of those elements there. Of course. I'm not anti-experimentation and and you know not continuing continuing to creatively push yourselves and play with the boundaries. Don't want to use that to what people like you've already for to restrict you, but you at least need to understand because that even helps you understand where the bridge is to where you want to take them anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Part of the interruption, I have to take this quick commercial break to let you know that we are sponsored by me because I signed myself. We signed ourselves. It's this brand man network. That's why we're called No Labels Necessary because no label, nobody else is necessary for us to get the train moving. So if you could just subscribe to show appreciation, we'd really appreciate that. Back to the program. You got um, a second clip by J- Jaleel too. We want to go ahead and play this one up as well. I think we Jaleeled out today. Hey. Like, <laughs> I'm a workhorse. Even yeah. dive in. I was promoting that song for two years before it blew up. I was promoting it, promoting it, promoting it. It didn't just blow up once I dropped mm. it. It seemed like that from like outside perspective. It you know? always seems like that. That's pretty motivational, man, for anyone watching, just because yeah. um, you- He said the golden words, it always seems like that. Always seems like that. <laughs> it always. always seems like that. We've been preaching it for years, man. <laughs> you know, anybody that's been watching us knows Man, at least at least three to six months, bro. We're gonna tell you to push some shit. Yep. Um, but it's always great to hear stories from artists that pushed it for a lot longer than that sometimes mm-hmm. because well, I like the, the the mold being broken of music takes off pretty quickly. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. that's the telltale sign to know an artist don't know what they're talking about when they're like, Oh, it's been two months. This shit ain't taken off yet. Like, oh, you knew here. <laughs> <laughs> you must have you must have just gotten the race, my guy. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? But so yeah, so I don't know, like that I just like hearing artists. Keep pushing that narrative. Like, hey man, it took me a minute. Hey, this shit took a while. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was I was pushing the same song for 15 months. You know what I'm saying? It started popping on month 16. Here we are now on month 38. You probably just heard this shit last week. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that mm-hmm. narrative needs to be out there more. Yeah. Um, because how many times have we've seen clients or just artists in general sitting on gold? Like <sighs> just to us the next hit. And they only want to push it for like a month, two months. That's it. So something six maybe even when it looks like it has at least another year on it. You know what I'm saying? You're like, man, this shit could, could keep going. Because we, we tell clients all the time, bro, like if you were to do everything in the marketing space for a single, like you'd be pushing your song for at least like three, six months. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Minimum three, six months. Uh, well, not everything. It's like if you well, – well, that's if you did – I think if you did like everything like once. You know what I'm saying? It's just like just ran through everything like a checklist. Probably like six months at least. 
Right, but we know that most of it is going to be shit you should keep going, you know what I'm saying, keep pushing and re reprocessing and reconfiguring and things like that. So it's like, bro, like you, to me, a, a song that's working or at least show signs that it could do well, I really feel like the minimum is like nine to 15 months. I agree. <laughs> I I agree. If, yeah, if it has that true promise, for real, for real. It yeah. doesn't mean you can't drop anything else in that time, but yeah, you got to keep yeah. pushing, keep believing. What's that? Don't stop believing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro, keep pushing that thing. And check this out. You just talked about that timeline. Artists start feeling a certain way if they're not blowing up a lot of times after like six months, a year, all right? If you ask any of these record labels or people who've broken many artists before, these are the people, by the way, who got all the tools in the tool shed, supposedly. These people mm-hmm. who could just plant somebody and apparently blow them up out of nowhere, smoke and mirrors, all that shit. These people will actually tell you two to three years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like minimum, that's what their expectations are. So if these people who have all these resources, done done it all, done it before, have those expectations, there's no way you as a single individual should be looking at six months, oh man, like I got to end my career. Like why ain't they feeling me? You know, of course you want to find progress throughout the way and start to build, but I'm all for managed expectations and pushing this newer timeline because boy, it would make it would change the game just for artists to change that mentality alone. Yeah, 100%, bro. Like they looked at building their artistry as like building a startup. You know, it's the same thing in business world. What's the stat? Mm-hmm. Most small businesses don't make it past year five. Yeah. Which to me says that if you're a small business at year six and up, you know what I'm saying, you're beating the, you beating the <laughs> statistic. Right? So it's like, yeah. I think if artists started to look at it more of like, from a numbers aspect, a percentage of how many people actually get to keep going through the marathon, mm. pretty much, right? Yeah. Because that, to me, is the biggest part of the music game. It's not about how many people in it are great. It's about how many in it are great and survive long enough for people to start realizing yep. that they're good. And it's, for some people, that, that changes, right? There's some artists who get their flowers in two years and some it takes them 10 years. You know what I'm saying? Like, that just kind of naturally yeah. becomes a part of the game. The marketplace is slower to certain people. But the reality of it is, is more than likely it's not going to be a quick thing. The the only artist I've ever truly heard of that blew up, like in a really short time span, was like Trinidad James. Like whenever he came out, saying he had been yeah. rapping for like five months or some shit before. Yeah. That's the shortest I've ever heard. You know what I'm saying? That's they, a, yeah, they definitely exist. I yeah, mean, the, even, the super even numbers. Baby was pretty fast because he came into that full system. Yeah, like year and a half. You know, you know all two. that stuff. Yeah. Even yeah. I remember once we had a conversation with one of our clients. I always remember, like, uh, it was an ad-only campaign, and his shit was starting to go crazy. And then he was like, man, like, you know, based on the way things are going now, like, how long would you say until I get to, like, you know, the X number consistently? I remember the exact number. And I remember I was like, oh, man, this shit keep going the way it's going. Probably, like, next, like, year, year and a half. And he was like, damn, a year, year and a half? I'm like, bro, that's short, bro. Because this <laughs> client was a client that we had, this was, like, his very first song oh, ever. yeah, Ground Zero. You know what I'm saying? Ground Zero, and, about, yeah. and it's working out. And I'm like, bro, if we got you from zero to, I think he wants to get to the point where he's doing like 100K to 300K monthly listeners or gang guys. If we get you to that within a year and a half time span with nothing but ads, because you remember that client wasn't doing nothing else crazy. Mm-hmm. So it's been all ads, bro, all advertising. Monthly bro. So listeners. Monthly, bro. Like, yeah. if we get you to that in a year, year and a half, that's crazy, bro. That's insane. Like, there, there will be no one out there that wouldn't want to know how you did that as fast as you did it, right? Because, like I said, there are anomalies. But everybody that knows anything about building and growing an artist would be like, damn, like a year? You know what I'm saying? A year yeah. from zero to 300,000? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's crazy. How the fuck you do that? So I think that a lot of times, even just artists being stuck behind the the, the perception that music is, is supposed to be a fast thing, like that is detrimental in itself. Because like you said, you start making these irrational decisions and you start, you know, making these, these tweaks and changes to things that maybe would have worked if you kept at it for six months. Because it wasn't working by the end of month one, you just kill it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But then it's like sometimes like we talk about a lot of marketing stuff that takes even time sometimes before it even starts working. You know what I'm saying? Like it might take you doing this thing for three months for it to even start producing some results. But then once it hits month three and up, that shit's gonna be crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's, it's like yeah. it's, it's gonna generate some wild results for you. So that's that's just what I get out there. It's like the the whole like needing to blow up or pop 
fast as an artist is probably the most detrimental mindset an artist can have because mm-hmm. it's, it's going to affect everything else you do and make you make bad decisions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, any kind of creative space like that, content online, so y'all watching in real time, we're probably, what, well, we're episode 12, we're 12 mm-hmm. episodes in, this podcast has been moving, all right? At some point, what, four or five months down the road, it's going to turn the corner and really move. Now, it might look like the views have been nice or whatever for somebody looking outside, but the difference of what it's going to be from here to then and how fast things are moving is going to be crazy. The difference is we know that. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we're used to that, and we've done it with so many things and so many people. We're not like, yo, how come we not getting a hundred thousand views on this? How come only one thousand people are viewing this episode in two thousand? And this, like, we already have the expectations in line, which is, is that I've I've heard Gary V talk about this actually, because uh, he says it about himself. Something about like being. Like he's super patient, but at the same time, within uh, the short yeah. term, oh. he's not patient, yeah. or, or like I don't know, it's like aggressive patient, something like that. Hyper right? patience, what, something, what is, something. What it, you say? It's hyper something like hyper patience. What, yeah, whatever yeah. that is, right? It's like you're patient in the short term, but you do still have to mean like be hyperactive in the middle, a midterm. Like you have to be aggressive. You still have to take those actions. But the problem is when people turn up and say, "Oh, I'm gonna go 10x in this moment." They feel like that means I'm speeding up the timeline in that way, which g- doing more should speed up your timeline from a macro standpoint. In general, mm-hmm. yes, it should. Doing 10 more, you should blow up faster than doing one level unit of, of energy. However, still, that 10x is actually still meaning you'll go from, what, 12 months to maybe six months. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean 10x and I'm going to blow up in one month. Mm-hmm. It can happen. Right, so uh, I just I definitely wanted to put that out there because I know one of the hardest parts is to feel like you're going real, real, real hard, and then not seeing that result. But because you start watching a lot close, you're like, I know I'm doing my shit. Like, like it's like lifting weights and all that stuff, running around the gym, and then you keep looking at the the uh, your how much you weigh yeah. every day. It's like, nah, it just, it just don't work like that, man. Yeah. It really doesn't. But with that being said. Got a quick transition. If you want to get your weight up (laughs) in terms of this music marketing, uh, we actually have a big announcement. Brandman Network has reopened in its new space. We have been working on this for a few months now. Mm -hmm. We had Brandman Network. Appreciate all y'all current members. We already have over 1K members, but now we're opening up the new space that is for free, by the way, for free. So we'll put the link in the bio where we got tons of courses. We have a lot of the TikTok game and how we blew up artists. The information is in there. The brand campaigns that's helped fans convert from people, uh, convert people's fan base and end up selling like 20K in merch and things like that. A lot of those stories, all that's in there and the tools that we use to get it, it's in there. So hop in the community today. It's invite only. So if you aren't invited by somebody, you can just apply at the link below. And when you apply of course, you have to be accepted. So make sure you apply to that. And back to our regularly scheduled programming, <laughs> let's get into the next topic, which is shaking up the industry. That's what we call in this segment right here. Shaking up the industry. Shakur, you also blessed us with this clip right here. Well, I've been on it. Uh, you, you've been on it, bro. You've been <laughs> on it, bro. Shoot. Uh-huh. We're going to give you some intern credits, dog. Timeline was buzzing <laughs> this weekend. Hey. <laughs> Let's check this out right here. Uh, the, the, uh, I hate that Facebook. I mean, YouTube, not Instagram does that. There we go. Can you hear that? I already did that. But they took it off Spotify and Apple? They didn't do nothing. I did. Why'd you do that? Why not? What do well, I gain? What about for? people that want to listen to the music? I get that. But what about the people who made the music that didn't get paid? What's more important? Yeah. How do they get paid the other way? When I restructure it and put it back up and put it in the right realm and the right business frame and make sure that the money's allocated to the right people, then it'll be back up. What the fans have to understand is that this is called show business. And a lot of times we give them the show without having our business together. Mm-hmm. So now we're getting our business right and they just going to have to allow us to get our business right. But the show must go on. 100%. But they still get to see, you know, bits and pieces of what we've done in the past. 
but it's about what we're doing now and how we maintain the legacy. And when I do present it back, it's going to be presented in a real way to where the people can actually have rights to owning it. Yeah. To making money off of it. What, you want to make it an NFT label I saw? Bet, bet, bet. Snoop said a mouthful right there. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big executive decision right there. Big time executive decision. Taking down all of Death Row's music off of Spotify and such. But we've talked about it before, you know, in our own conversations, how Snoop Dogg, he just moves different for a legend. Like yeah. the way the pulse he keeps on the internet, the way he's been moving in this metaverse into NFT space has been really interesting because he's been doing it right. Right as an early mover, so to speak, from, from a music side, where a lot of times people just try to do a cash flip. And, you know, it looks like it's right because they, they did, oh, they made $10 million in one week. He's doing it where that long money is about to come. Probably yeah. has the patience because he already has long money, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, but the, like, the, the real value of this, obviously, is just the fact that, one, this is shaking up the industry, but getting that business together, period, right? Like that was what, you know, you shared this, but that was one of the things that I thought about here. It's like, once you have that leverage, now you immediately start saying, how can I make all my business moves be right from, from here, all right? Whether that's leverage, because now you have a fan base and you have a little bit more leverage against your label, the management and everything around you. But then also the next level of leverage is, I have enough money to not be thinking short term. Yeah. Right? I yeah. don't need this. So not let me just not not um let's not just go hit another lick. Let's figure out how we can build this right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you <laughs> I think you said an important point too. I don't need this. You know what I'm saying? Like Yeah. I I would like to believe that if it, this was a significant part of his catalog, you know, he would still have moved the same way. I would like mm -hmm. to believe that. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I have my my skepticisms about from <laughs> from artists from that era, bro, because they all just grew up in a in a shitty music industry. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, yeah. so I don't like knock it when they violate other artists and so it's like I I don't condone it, but I understand. It's like you didn't you weren't taught any better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You coming through. So you know, kudos to him, especially at a time where the opposite of that is you know the Diddy and Mace situation. Um, or the Irv Gotti and, and Ashanti situation, you know what I'm saying? So it's like these are artists who are coming out of the old school music industry, you know what I'm saying, mentality that are still like, hey, it's not right, but it's making money, so yeah. fuck it, we're going to keep doing it. So as I said, the fact that he's not doing it, there's there's some there's some power in that, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I think it's far. I think yeah. it's far. Yeah. It's funny, obviously, that we're talking about that because Snoop's talking about getting paid through these NFTs and he considers that to be right. But then – also, Meek, there's this announcement that Meek Mill wants to drop his album on Cash App. You want to drop a Cash album, a Cash App album? That would actually be far. I think that would be hard. Would I be feel far. like there's a sponsorship in the works. Maybe not with him, but yeah, like bro. Cash App probably seasons are like, hey, yeah, like bro. that's a good idea. We did the Joe Budden sponsorship. Why not? Like Cash yeah. App. Cash App's been moving hard. Like last two years, of trying to be like moved into the vertical with music. Like I would say, probably, yeah, probably like since the pandemic. They've been going hard at being like culturally relevant. There we go. There we yeah. go. So, I mean, the full headline, obviously, he wants to do JPay or Cash App. But as I told you, I said, I ain't know nothing about Cash uh, JPay. You said that was a way to send inmates? Yeah, it's like a, like a prison payment. A prison payment system. system. It's, okay. it's like PayPal for prisoners is probably the best PayPal way. for prisoners, man. Like, that's a hell of a tagline. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Because he don't want to get paid a dollar every 1,000 streams. Now, the math might not be exact, a dollar every 1,000 streams. However, the sentiment is very clear. He wants to get paid what he feels like he's worth, and he feels like it's not worth the money if I'm getting paid very little for streams. And we're going to see this continue, mm -hmm. right? There's too many artists that, I'll say this. There's a lot of artists that existed before streaming popped, right? So they saw those numbers, right? Even Meek is like right before streaming went hard. Yeah, he remembers. He remembers, right? <laughs> He's old enough to remember. That's that gap, right? So when you have that memory, you're like, nah, it shouldn't look like this. <laughs> Granted, streaming has saved a lot in terms of a macro for music in some ways. And it's a lot helped. A, it's been a part of 
the revenue growth in the music industry. However, I th- I, I can I can if I'm an established artist already, I'd be offended, right? If I saw those numbers. Which is why all of them are acting like they're offended. Like all of them are like, I ain't mess with that. Taylor Swift was like, oh no, I don't want my stuff to be on here. Well, Jay-Z was like, okay, I'm gonna create my own platform so I can get m- more money from mine and some of these from from the uh from these other artists. Like no one who existed before is happy. Like our clients who were existing before, nobody, I've never known any artist who existed before streaming that was happy with the numbers and don't still talk about it to this day. Everybody who's just trying to get in the game or this is just what they're used to, you're either not worried about it because I'm not there enough to worry about it. You know, there's like it's your parents complain about stuff and it just is what it is. And then all of a sudden you got your own rent to pay and mm-hmm. you're like, dang, you got your own house. And it's like, dang, that light bill did change relative to how much I had the lights <laughs> on. I <could> kinda, <laughs> like maybe I should turn the lights off. That's why that's what I be thinking about now. I'm like, damn, I never said I wanted to turn the lights off. But now I got to tell my, my girl, I'm like, nah, turn that shit off, girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you got that. And then you got the people who this is all they know. Mm-hmm. And Spotify has been a godsend for them because all I know is I wasn't making no money from this music. Now I'm making 5K a month from this music. 3K yeah, I'm, a month I'm making something. Music. I'm making something. <laughs> so it's hard for the newer artists to truly see it that way or be as aggressive about changing the game and, and some of these other routes. But, you know, you got the little Russells out there that are playing that game. But, but I don't even think he's doing it just from a, what I see from a distance to be like anti Spotify is yeah. just like, Hey, I got to hustle and get my money in, in other ways. And how can I make this a part of my community and do it better? That's what it seems like from him. But like the, the, the newer artists don't really seem to have that same um, revenge approach to, <laughs> to what Spotify yeah. and DSPs are doing. Cause I think, I think the smart artist is thinking about DSPs differently. Because you, you brought up a great point, right? Like, Taylor Swift left Spotify at one point. Jay-Z left. Mm-hmm. A lot of major artists have left, but they all came back. Mm-hmm. They all came back. Wow. And I think that's because it it can be argued that DSPs are probably the greatest music discovery tools to ever hit music consumership, right? Yeah, because it it truly has democratized the playing field. Like you could literally shoot off into a whole field of music that no one is necessarily like pushing you to 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 like. I guess I mean you could argue the algorithm, I guess, but there's no there's no entity necessarily like pushing you to like like something, right? It can it can it, there is a degree where it's dictated by consumer taste, what they like, what their friends are recommending, and things like that. So like I don't I've started to train myself to not even look at. Spotify is instead like a viable monetization tool. It's like, no, this is just a marketing tool. This is a way that that's what they want you to do, Jacob. You right, you that's right. What they but that <laughs> it's working and they're winning, yeah. and you know what I'm saying. But and, and it, it's not the worst thing because it's like I. Yeah. It, it kind of makes me think of the TikTok model, right? Like we talked a lot about how there are TikTok creators who feel a type of way about the money they're being paid from TikTok, and I'm like, I can understand why TikTok is like, no, we're literally bringing you the audience in mass numbers with relatively little to no work on your end compared to other social platforms. But like, yeah, there's work, but like compared to YouTube, you know what I'm saying? Getting a hundred thousand followers on TikTok compared to getting a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's not the it's not the the same amount of work. So I could see TikTok going like, hey man, like we're bringing you all this attention that's giving you the ability to monetize. Yeah, we're gonna only give you fifty percent. You know what I'm saying? Like so I kind of look at Spotify the same way. With Spotify, I was like, hey, we're probably like, hey, we're the ones building the, algor- the algorithm that's introducing you to these new people. Like, right, like these new people would have never known you existed without our platform and our setup. Yep. So, yeah, we're going to not give you certain opportunities and not give you certain money because, yeah, you could argue that this is your IP that drives the platform. But for you guys who it's much harder to monetize for, the discovery could literally be life or death for you. Mm-hmm. So that's why you're not going anywhere else because as much as you hate this shit, there isn't really too many platforms or tools that compete with us in terms of discovery. TikTok has gotten, TikTok is probably the closest non-DSP app, you know what I'm saying, to, to being um, something heavy like that. But I just think like ours just need to kind of fold and look at it that way, bro. It's like, yeah, like, it should almost be like your streaming money is just a part of like your break even, your break even funnel, right? Whatever your growth funnel looks like for yourself, this ad set up, this influencer set up, your DSP money should be like, hey, I spent five thousand dollars, I made back you know four thousand dollars in streaming revenue, 
you know what I'm saying, to they help me get enough people that I now go to try to sell 30K in merch, you know what I'm saying, too. And that's yeah. where my, my real money is going to come from. See, I think the thing about that is it's not just the discoverability. Because that's the new age tech version of, hey, bro, it's going to be a good look. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's all they're saying. And you know how people feel about that. After yeah. a while. I was like, bro, come on now. Like, I need some substance. So you giving me good looks to avoid really giving me what I'm worth. Now, the new artist, again, you're looking for some kind of look. The older artist, I think the leverage that the platform has for them isn't necessarily the good look because they already have those good looks. They already have that leverage. It's about survival, mm-hmm. right? At some point, you're losing your audience's attention and you have to be where they are. Yeah. That's where they are listening to music. And as much as you would like to say, hey, I could just bring all these folks over here and now they can blast my Taylor Swift and my Beyonce on this separate in this separate space. We know that many people aren't going to do that. Yeah. They yeah. already got your behavior. That's how they win. That's why these tech platforms scale so quickly. It's like, yo, we want to get big enough where there's the network effect and we have such a large audience that they aren't going to want to go anywhere else. Right. Because I can listen to X, Y, Z here. And if they go to the Beyonce app, all they can listen to is Beyonce. As much as they love Beyonce, everybody also want to listen to somebody else too. Nobody's just a fan of one person. Yeah. So you start losing that uh, advantage of what's one of the marketing elements placement, right. Being placed in the right position. So that's why the tech platforms have been so good at not only doing it to individual artists, but doing it to the labels. The labels be like, oh, dang, man. All right, we, we got the IP, fortunately, so we can prevent you from doing it to a certain extent and figure out how we participate. All right, that's their leverage. Like They're like, we got the IP. If anything, if all else fails, we got IP. The tech platforms, though, they because they they can't like the labels can't compete in terms of attention and understanding that tech platforms like as long as we get the people, we get the eyes, they're going to have to negotiate Mm -hmm. with us for their IP because you can't just build another one of these. Like how many of these social media platforms have not hit the threshold where there's enough people on there and people care for long enough? It's hard to do that. Yeah. All right. So they know, hey, you can't just do me overnight, man. Like, so go ahead, figure out <laughs> uh, what that deal is going to be. And that's why they violate so much, too. Yeah. Like, how many times are you, is, oh, man, TikTok owes this mon- amount of money to the record labels. And TikTok's like, nah, we don't want anything yet, but we'll make a deal at some point. It'll be like a year later, still haven't made a deal because they know. And, they, and, and all the time, they're just growing and growing and growing, impact yeah. growing, yeah. knowing that they're getting more and more leverage throughout the, the, um, the way. That's why I've been saying for years, it's just like tech is in a space where they're finally going to be the ones who take the labels down. It's not going to be, you know, artists. It's just going to be a tech platform. And this is before TikTok. It seems like it's going to be TikTok outside of like, you know, America kicking it out. Like, because they, I don't know if you're familiar, they're bringing those those conversations back, by the way. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, especially if a Republican gets in office. Yeah. They're, they're, a lot of them are pretty um, big on that as far as the politician side. But, but yeah, like TikTok is seeming to be that one. If it's not them, it's going to come. They're, they're just showing you what's possible through a tech platform. We control the awareness. We control the artists from ground zero, pretty much. Have all their content on our platform, blow them up, have a distribution platform that they can now get on. We participate in that. We know we, know we got our puppet stuff going in the background where we can boost the followers. Yes, that's a thing on TikTok, right? And, and, and get them more views, but legitimately yeah advertising data we got all of it here bruh like we got it here so <laughs> now you just said something i didn't think about all right but, the same way the labels have the music catalog the stream the the well the social platforms have their content catalog i never thought about it that way before hell yeah damn that's crazy hell yeah. hell yeah which actually think about the content catalog something that we didn't um, weren't aware of y'all should be aware of shout out to Damien oh, yeah. Ritter yeah. almost said Lillard but <laughs> you know we were in, in LA and we had that conversation with him and he was telling us how people are buying YouTube content catalogs in the same way people can buy your catalog on 
um, you know, for Spotify music, well, not Spotify music, for your music catalog, same way people can buy that because there's a value to it. There's people who are out here buying your YouTube catalog because it's content. It can be monetized. We know that your YouTube content continues to be monetized. You have old content that's getting advertising, but also YouTube videos, the length, there's all these platforms that are popping up that are actually looking for content on their mm. platforms. I don't know if you've seen, like, there's something on my TV called Freebie. There's, yeah. like, Tubi. Yeah. They're all looking for some type of content. Yeah. It's always a B. It's, it's always, bro, always. <laughs> As a matter of fact, over Thanksgiving, with my family, all the kids were around, there was, one, through one of those channels, it was basically a YouTube channel, but it wasn't YouTube. I don't want to say YouTube channel, but it wasn't YouTube. It wasn't YouTube, but they were showing a show that pretty much was a YouTube show. It was these kids running around the house, and they had all these skits going on. It was some brother and sister and maybe like two of their friends or something. And it was just showing on regular TV through one of those channels. And I can imagine, because I can tell, I know a YouTube video when I see it. Yeah. It's like, it probably got licensed, right? So that whole catalog situation makes sense that they're purchasing that. But it goes back to the idea that, Everything you're creating now can be monetized. There's different ways, right? But it's beyond just how much do I make from the advertising on my video. And I think artists start to start um, realizing that, like, get creative with what you what you actually build. Because if it's desirable, even if even if it's not getting a lot of views on YouTube or something or TikTok or whatever, there's the opportunity to license to these other spaces and places. Yeah, or figure out your own monetization op around it. Like what? Like an in-house setup, like what me Miller talking about doing, right? Like, I, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, he's he's essentially asking for like Patreon band camp models without the Patreon, you know, what I'm saying band camp yeah. <laughs> platform. Yeah. Um. So it's like you know, it's th- there's always an option to I think take the risk and just see, which I do think is something that every artist, at, especially at his level, should. Do it at least once in their careers. Like, just do a temperature check, bro. Like, see where your audience is at without all of the label set up, right? Like, see what you can get away with. I'm gonna put together this unique merch experience or this unique product experience or show experience, whatever. Just to just to have an understanding of where you are in the marketplace. Because yeah. if you go like, man, I got twenty thousand active motherfuckers that's ready to buy some stuff. You know what I'm saying? That changes the game versus like, you know, you learn like, hey, I only got a thousand. Like, man, I gotta, you know, maybe I do need to get into fan building mode, right? Or like I said, you see, hey, I got 50,000. Shit, fuck all that dropping new music. I might just need to take the next year to figure out how to get these 50,000 people to spend some money on me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and put something together that gets them excited about that. So I do think every artist, especially of his caliber, who is recently going indie or like attempting to tackle the indie model needs to do like a temperature check. See, let's talk about that the different ways to monetize and just some of the history of Mm. like the monetization fan base capturing, because you talk about Meek Mill doing the cash app thing 10 years before, roughly speaking, that's kind of similar to the Jay-Z Samsung deal. Remember that Mm -hmm. Magna Carta, Holy Grail. And it was launched on there exclusively for a period of time, something like that. Yeah. Right. All of these platforms, are always looking for some type of marketing advantage or promotion to do. So, like you said, it doesn't have to be through the traditional content on social media. If I could just figure out who do I need to partner with, if I'm a big artist, you should take that risk because there's going to be somebody who says, hey, we're trying to bring attention to our tech platform. You do the deal, especially, you know, if it's a super risk and it's new, you're not trying to um, make, make it, exclusive in perpetuity or anything like that but hey you might get you a a, a half a meal a whole meal yeah. you know 2x or whatever that is for a, the first month and then it goes on to spotify and all these other things right and that'd be interesting because then you'll probably see people develop like these two-tiered mo- rollouts right it's like to make that initial launch and then what is the available everywhere launch look like right yeah it's but, almost like the the uh release I'm trying to think, release strategy. What was it like last year when everyone was doing like the regular albums and the deluxe albums? Like a couple yes, of years later. Exact, yes. That was basically it. That, exactly. Yeah. That type of thing. Because it, this reminds me of, too, you know, how people have been doing this stuff for a while. I was listening to Will Smith's audiobook, which was good as hell. 
I didn't think it was that good. I was bored at first. <laughs> and I stopped listening to it for a minute. He did a little slap moment with Chris Rock. And about three moments later, I say did it with Chris Rock. Like they like, hey, <laughs> like they did it together, right? <laughs> Here's my hand. Here's my face. Um, three minutes, like three months later, so probably like August, I started listening to it again. And then once I got into a certain period, shit got really good because um, it started getting you know around his actual music career and stuff. Yeah. And one thing he mentioned was they had this phone line where people would call in yeah. and he was getting I forgot how much it cost for the phone line but when you did the math I think it was like 5 or 10,000 dollars a day that he was making maybe it got up to 20,000 but it was some ridiculous math of people just calling in calling in calling in to talk to him right and you know you bring that into the future Oh, that's that same type of personal experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, when they were calling in, they were calling in just to hear a voicemail, a special voicemail from him. So it's not like he was there talking to everybody. It was like a minute long and they could, some people want to play it back again and mm -hmm. they had longer messages and all that type of stuff. So people are literally calling in just to hear this special voicemail so you can give them an update. It was like social media. They'll be on tour. Hey, yo, I'm out on tour. It's the Fresh Prince. We about to go to this city and the show is live and da, 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 da. Uh, hey, yo, we're in Miami <laughs> now. Jazzy Jeff just hurt his head on the on the, uh, on the the floor or something, da, 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 last show because it was so crazy. Yeah. And giving those updates and they're tuning in just for that, which is like social media almost. It's like a tweet, yeah. an audio yeah. tweet that they're calling in for. So it's like, dang, that's crazy. And they were paying for it. And now we hear like, Oh, well, now we hear about text message marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And now we got social media and staying up, date, up to date. It's like, so all these elements, and when you study far back enough and look at more and more things, it's like they always existed. Yeah. And the value was always there. So sometimes we like to just talk about the game now. This is messed up and da 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 da, -da Or this is far more accessible. Overall, things have gotten better, I would say. Like, it's hard to argue that things haven't gotten better overall in terms of like opportunity, quality, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. but the tech stuff, it's like, yeah, the, opp the, the opportunities to do it might have been harder back then and the game might have flipped where you're focused on one thing or another, but every single era, there's an artist who thrives on one and they struggle with the other. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you might have been a good recording studio artist, right? There's some artists these, these days who suck at at shows and performing back then you could build an audience off of just putting on like great shows mm -hmm. and that was the thing and then next thing you know you level up and get more attention from that or you get opportunities from that just from killing at a show today an artist still the the impact is still there but artists don't get enough credit for their show game right or no they don't get enough um What's the word I'm looking for? Punishment for a bad show game. <laughs> like that's just, what's not happening. Just go way under the radar. Way under the radar. They just let it be. It's kind of one of those. It's it's tolerated. But back then, that shit was not tolerated, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's the the ebbs and flow. Today, looks are I, I don't want to say they they matter more. Like they never they never matter. But looks can get you further, or like personality can get you further without the music than before. Before, you had to lead with music, right? And of course, looks can always elevate you or be a part of the image, but you also had uh, some of those periods, especially especially like Jim Crow or like you know, in the more racist times where you go far back enough where they'll have black artists writing and singing, mm -hmm. and then they'll have like white artists lip syncing mm -hmm. <laughs> for, the, for the white audiences. So they don't even represent their own music. It was on some Millie Vanilli type shit, right? So you literally didn't have to look the par, be the par. Now, obviously, that was a bad situation. That wasn't like, hey, I don't want to be seen. That was like my image or my music is taken from me. But the point is, there's all the, the, the game has different ways to tweak it in every era that benefits or hurts somebody. Now, if you don't like the game or you complain about it now, either... You're not seeing it correctly and taking advantage of the things that are there, or you just chalking it up to the the lottery game and said I was born in the wrong place in the wrong time and you know find another career I guess. <laughs> I always wonder if artists from other 
eras ever said that. Like, was an artist in the seventies? Like, man, I should have been an artist in like the fifties. You know what I'm saying? Like, back when they was, bruh. <laughs> you know, I bet I one hundred percent think because that's like a thing that everybody yeah. does, right? I wish yeah. I was born ten years prior or whatever. <laughs> but you know who would have been lit as fuck today, bro? James Brown. Yes. But that's not who the hell I'm talking oh, okay, about. That, okay, was a, okay. that was a great statement. You're throwing me <laughs> off with, that, with the, <laughs> the accuracy. I wanted to say no, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking similar enough, though. I was thinking Little Richard. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Bruh. 100%. This dude was a star, dog. I saw this interview, bruh, of him. I, I'm going to see if I can find it, actually. Of him just talking. And I'm like... Oh, this dude's a star, bro. Like, it was just a quick interview, and the way he talked, that shit was like, okay, if he was in this era, bro, he just he just have social media followers. He was a legit musician and all that great stuff, but I'm like, oh, he would have a following just off of his his his, his talk. Let me see if I can find that joke real quick. I yeah, feel bro. like I've this to somebody I know. But Keep that going. that be the 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 cool shit. It goes back to the why I think. Artists have to pay attention to older artists to some degree because you see exactly what you just said, man. How much of this shit that I think was new today mm-hmm. that really is just a variation of some shit they were doing back then. Exactly. And it's just like we talked about in that clip um, about the Travis Scott box. Most of music, a lot of the times, is somebody finds an opportunity and takes advantage of it before somebody else does, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like you learn about this opportunity day one and it takes the rest of the industry 90 days to catch on to it. And by the time they catch on to it, you've already capped on it to a massive degree. Yep. And it's becoming normalized and now it doesn't work the same, right? That's it work. like there's there's a batch of artists that always come along and, and that happens for and I even think about times where it probably happened on accident. You know, like we talked about artists like J. Cole and Kendrick coming up during the early YouTube era. I think about now I'm thinking about what I know about YouTube back then and about how a lot of those YouTubers talked about how much the algorithm would just like flood you with attention back then, right? It's like, damn, they just were like Right yep. place, right time. You know what I'm yep. saying with with good music, and, and it kicked off in this thing, or um, or even like Russ with the the SoundCloud stuff. Yep. Like the first time I ever heard about the the song a week strategy, I was like, oh, it's like dropping a piece of content consistently that just keeps triggering the algorithm of a platform. So he just kept hitting the, the SoundCloud algorithm so much yep. that eventually it took off. He probably wasn't thinking of it that way, but that's how that shit hit, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's this this technology of this space that's that hasn't been taken advantage of yet. And everybody does that shit and it doesn't work. It doesn't work the same. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I feel like that is one of the hardest parts of staying in music is that you are 80% trying to figure out how to build a system within a framework that is already put together while spending 20% of your attention trying to like look out to what's going to be next. So you can try to cap yes. on it as soon as it hits. And it's like that, like your eyes literally cross trying to like look at both sides <laughs> of it at the same time and keep up with right, it. That's perfectly said. <laughs> that, because that is the nature of fast moving culture yeah. that music has to present itself within. Like it's cultural based and culture moves so fast within yeah. those trends. And then you got the tech that culture moves on moving as fast as well. So then you triple that. It only increases. But I found that clip that I was talking about. So <laughs> check check this out, bro. This this dude is let me why is it it's so full screen? Let me just just listen to this man. Hold up. Five sisters, but I was the best looking one of all of them. And I'm not conceited at all. What do they all do now? Uh well I have a brother, he's a CPA. My sisters are two sisters are nurses. But you're the only person that's in Yes, show in show business. Yeah. I'm the only one. See, because they don't like to dress like I do. I like to put it on. I had noticed, actually. I love to put it on. I like to shine. In fact, I think everybody's supposed to do their own thing. This is what you call doing your own thing time. Do you always dress like that? or Every day. I go to the grocery store like this, and people turn around. When I walked in the airport here in London today, a man dropped his cup of coffee. I notice you're wearing makeup. Do you wear makeup? Yes, I do. All I the know time? that. Yes, you're supposed to wear makeup. Just, you know, just like when you to- toast your bread, no. I put sugar in your coffee. You're supposed to add a little touch to it. Yes, I must remember that. Yes, God. You're supposed to do it. My mother have 12 kids. I have. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> I'm like, this dude is, is like gold, bro. Just so many sound bites waiting to happen. First, <laughs> first and foremost, my mother got 12 kids, seven. Seven uh, sons, five daughters. 
I'm the best looking one of all of them, <laughs> and I'm not conceited. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been a viral TikTok sound, eh? That right? <laughs> you just like, <laughs> like, you just call them ugly, like, because you're not conceited. Or, like, he just, but he, he said it all, like, so seriously, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's the thing. Yeah. It was all chill, not that extra, which makes it, which takes the star quality of it even more. Right, yeah. where it's not like I'm doing extra trying to get attention, like man. Yeah, I was but like, this dude is interesting. That is the one thing, and I hate to be like that, you know, that old heady Uh-oh. guy, bro. But that do be one of the things I miss about like older generations of music artists is that they put a lot more emphasis on like being entertaining all the time. You know, yeah. like they were always in character and always trying to be entertaining. Like artists, they don't want to be entertaining. They want to be, they just want you to like the music and just be there for that. Yeah, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's weird you say that because they voice that, and then the way they try to validate that is by referencing old artists. Yeah, and the old artists would be like, "No, that's not what it was like. You had to go. We we had training development. How do we walk? How do we talk? How yeah, do we bro. present ourselves at all time? We are in a character, and we up here trying to work life balance this artist shit." And that's happening in every industry, by the way. Everybody want to do the four-hour work. We work from home, yeah. not necessarily have to put into it and all that stuff. So it's it's not just the artists. It's, it's cultural in general. But it's funny you said that just because I never thought about the fact that they use old artists to try to validate. God, yeah, it should be music. Like, it, it's not appreciated the way it used to be. Back in the day, it was all about the artists again. Right. Like, bro, they built no, whole characters and narratives. And they were down to do whatever it took. You know what I'm saying? To, to to reach the top, bro. But at the very least, understood that, like, hey, as an artist, all aspects of me have to be entertaining. Yes. All the time. At least when people see me, right? I have to, I have to throw my cape on and be a superhero, pretty much. Exactly. And like I said, today, a lot of artists are just like, oh, I just want to make good music. I don't want to be entertaining. It's like, but we want you to be entertaining. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, you're supposed to be our ray of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, like, there is this consumer thing that exists today where people want to feel the relatability some Mm -hmm. type of authenticity but at the same time there's always going to be a desire for the superhero like you said right people entertainment is about escapism at the end of the day yeah right so you can't make it too real like people always it's always funny when people argue about like oh this movie wasn't realistic enough right to me because so I used to um, do theater and film scripting and all that stuff. And one thing that I always, I always thought about was like, if this shit was like real, real realistic, you'd be bored as hell. Cause you're not, <laughs> you don't want to watch a movie that's tracking every literal motion. You have to do the time lapse jumps. Yeah. You get the point of it. So you want to communicate it in a way where it's felt, mm. right? But you don't actually want to see somebody wake up, walk down every single stair, brush their yeah. teeth for real in real time. That's not what you're here for. So people, when people demand this realism, it's 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 representative. It's representative of like some level of authenticity and my willing suspension of the belief, but it's not truly the real like you want you to say right and it's like oh snap the, this rapper shot five people it's like well y'all are like oh snap why in in w melly like actually kill his friend right it's like wait like when it's real real it snaps people out a little bit right so allegedly by the way i'm gonna say that even with the history of it right yeah. <laughs> but but <laughs> um it, it's, it's such a interesting thing and i think a huge part of hacking culture and escaping the matrix if you will <laughs> <laughs> is is uh not getting caught up in words as people say them and what and figuring out what they actually mean all right and then tracking what they're referencing by like for instance you're tracking old schools like people say this say this say this and you'll just assume that's what it really is but then you do your own research and make a connection it's like wait that's not exactly it like, and that's why history when they say i i finally really get this today this is how wild th- this area is it's not just because i'm older i feel like it's because today is just so wild and they like our culture is so self-indulgent where we dismiss like the past and think we're just making everything so much better and not like it finally makes me understand the statement of if you don't know your past you're doomed to repeat the future because mm-hmm. well doomed to repeat it in your future because 
we really have people truly rewriting history or just people don't know when something happened. So you just believe the current hype. Let's put it that way. I don't even want to get into rewriting history or like super conspiracy or nothing. It's just you're so caught up in the current hype, you don't understand that this happened before. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And now you don't understand what the impact of doing that movement or this movement or or this style of marketing and all that stuff, how it went. And it already failed before. Or it already won, but the uh, the result that happens after that. Well, I could get into some examples, but I... I don't want to get too far beyond like <laughs> like music. That'll take me down a whole rabbit hole. But is is but you even see it within music where people are constantly thinking something is new and it's not. And we talked about that in the other podcast, right? Yeah. And it's like there's a you know a ignorance is bliss aspect where you kind of want that because you're discovering something as a first time as an as you know a young person coming up. But on the other end like that disconnect if you don't actually understand it and you don't actually just study the game how it was now before you and even the era before that you start to like buy into the hype of shit that don't deserve it yeah yeah that makes sense yeah um because bro like this little richard shit bro james brown i i watched the motown doc recently um and have you seen the Motown doc, the Hitsville? Okay, I was about to say, which one? Yeah, but, No, I don't think I've seen that I one. I didn't realize there were so many of them, <laughs> yeah. actually. But they, I didn't realize that they leveraged the four motor way of deal, building out their assembly line. Well, they took the assembly line method and applied it to their artists, right? It makes sense. They're Detroit, right? Yeah. But they literally said, hey, we're going to, put them in arts development. They had all these layers, right? And you were going to take you down this assembly line to blow you up. And that's why the quality control was so big. They even had a department called quality control, which made me think, I wonder if that was an inspiration for, you know, P and Coach K Mm -hmm. quality control. Because they made a big thing about it. There's a department quality control. And they're literally taking the artists, all right? How do you develop your music? How do we get you in the room with these writers? A lot of the stuff that exists today, but it was – more control because today now an artist might not truly be signed to my label i got a manager and they can dip and dabble into different things you know you have to truly be committed to it on a one-on-one basis but before they're literally putting everybody through the same shit and you would think that would create a sameness among all the artists and there's no differentiation there's no unique nature of it I believe Lil Richard was actually on Motown one point in time or somewhere. Like he was related in, around that story some way. But if you look at what Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Temptations, these aren't the same, right? Of course, there's a quality of music at Bay, but these are not the same artists, right? And many of them were even using the song, same songwriters. So it's funny how... I, I I actually wonder, actually, I, I would like to go deeper into that or like find, ask somebody. There's somebody in Atlanta who's apparently like a GOAT artist development person. Um, but like, how do you take people through the same system and ensure that instead of making them more alike based off some dogma, you amplify whatever you, is unique about them? Because that's apparently what they did. Yeah, I could kind of, uh, I, like, I think about the the show aspect of it, right, where let's say a core component of a good show that we know is crowd engagement, mm-hmm. and maybe we really beat crowd engagement into our artist's head, but crowd engagement for you might look like telling a story to your audience about, I don't know, the inspiration behind one of a song, one of the songs, and crowd engagement to me might look like, I don't know, me stage diving or you know what I'm saying? or me pulling a, a, a fan from the crowd up on stage and having them play a game or something right so right. i can kind of see that where it's like hey we have these core elements or core fundamentals and we're trying to figure out what is your way of implementing this core fundamental true right this this core thing it, I, it's all it makes me almost think of like a coaching program today right it's like like businesses can join the same coaching program all from different industries So it's like this process doesn't 100% apply to all of us exactly the same, but we're making the framework fit like where we're kind of coming from. That's 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 kind of how I imagine it. That's the only way it will make it will make sense to me is like, hey, all 20 of you, 
we need to get amazing at performing. Well, we need each of you to, you know, get good breath control. So maybe you decide to play basketball every day for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You you jump rope for 30 minutes a day. Yeah. And then, like, you you run two miles a day. Right? Like, it's like same result getting accomplished. We all just doing it in, in different ways. But the core is still kind of there. That's, that's how I would imagine it yeah. kind of works. I like that. I like that because I even just got reminded when you said that that there was this one group that couldn't really dance like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and they made fun of it, but they had their own way yeah. of making some shit shake with the <laughs> fact that they couldn't dance. So that's definitely the the uh, idea of it. Like you said, the elements are there, but how can we we do it in a way that works for you? But yeah, that, that documentary is dope as hell. Anybody who's interested in it. You said it's called Hitsville? Hitsville. Okay. Hitsville. It's, it's real interesting. I'm going to watch it again because I was around a lot of people when I watched it, you know what I mean, for Thanksgiving. So there was yeah. a lot of shit I also couldn't hear <laughs> at the same time. You know how that go. But um, next story, what would you do if I told you that you should wait eight years to drop a music video? Why am I asking that question? Because Shy Glizzy's white girl went platinum independently He's releasing the official video today. Well, that's been a three days ago. Eight years later. Eight uh, years after the song came out, he's dropping a music video. What you think about this? Man, it goes back to that minimum 12 to 15 months. You know what I'm saying? This was, I don't know, what's 12 times eight? 96? 96 months. You know what I'm saying? For the takeoff. But, I mean, we've seen this before. Well, I think a lot more recently. Like, J. Cole had all of those old songs that he dropped videos to. Chris Brown. There was the yeah, Chris Brown situation earlier this year yeah. or a couple months ago where older songs popped off. And so I think this is an important emphasis to the conversation that we keep having about IP and catalog moving forward, whereas, hey, there might be this thing that you make in 2022, uh, 2020, uh, 2022, that doesn't become valuable until 2030. Yeah. But when 2030 hits and people start finding some value in it, as long as you're in a position to cap off of it, yep. who fucking cares? You know what I'm saying? Cap off that shit. And, and go ahead and make your money back or, 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 or 2X, 5X, whatever it kind of looks like. So I think that we're going to see more stories like this, especially now because of like the boom of how many quality music artists there are. I think we're going to see a lot of this where like there are artists today putting shit out and they single don't really take off for like four or five years. You know yep. what I'm saying? Because um, of how um, saturated the marketplace is getting. But I think that this is a testament to what we were talking about earlier about not jumping the ship so fast and being patient enough to keep pushing something while you see it working and when you feel like there could be a moment behind it. Because, I mean, and I think it's just smart on his part. It's like, hey, this thing is getting me a moment today. Who cares if it's old? There are people that are learning about it today that is new to them. Let me go ahead and exactly. treat it like it's new. And the fact that, you know, they said eight years, I'm assuming it probably also took eight years for it to go platinum independently. Mm-hmm. All right? Hey, might take a little longer, but he got there. And that mm-hmm. accolade is a hell of an accolade, no mm-hmm. matter like which way you, you shake it, right? Going platinum. But then, you know, the thing that I think about here is what you said. Things might take a while to hit their true monetization point or their true level of awareness. However, when you think about the game as a, as a whole, I get it. I don't want to wait eight years for my shit to blow up. Or, or I don't want to wait five years or three years. So the game has become, because of the way online works, let me figure out what I can cap on now. And then I have that IP that might start to come into play at different times. And then next thing you know, this is when you get to that powerful point where you're Snoop Dogg or somebody like that, where you always have something that's having a moment because you have so much out, you have so much of an image, you have so much goodwill with a certain amount of people I can come out with a movie over here mm-hmm. off of my image alone. Oh, this song just got remixed. Shoot, this song just got remixed again. And now all of a sudden the original's popping off. Maybe I drop a music video to that. Oh, two other songs are getting remixed. This song just got used in a movie. Oh, it's the 25th anniversary of this project, mm-hmm. right? Like things just start to happen because it's all out there, right? That song never got any play at all. But all of a sudden, a sample or a reperformance or something happened, right? Like they're so it's almost like not almost. It truly is a game of let me continue 
to live another day, right? Until I can live another day comfortably. And then I can just wait out all the moments that are to come and be in a position to take advantage of it versus, oh yeah, the moments come, but somebody else is owning my shit. Oh yeah, the moments come, but I'm not in the game enough to even take advantage of whatever the opportunity is. So yes, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's a positive way that I feel like to look at it that you can wait that long and something still could happen. But then the realistic side of it, which I know artists get discouraged about is shoot, hey, bro, I want to live. I got stuff to do. So, yeah, we do have to find that short term pop. I get it. But but boy, if you can last and increase your relevance, and maintain and all them snowballs start to trickle at one time. It can be real sweet down the road. Yeah, that's like I was saying earlier in this episode, bro. Like, so much of the game is literally just how long can you stick out the marathon? That's it. Right? It's a hundred of us at the starting line. And by the time we get to the finish line, it's seven of us. Yep. <laughs> you know, all of us falling off for different reasons. Good reasons sometimes, even, right? I've seen artists get taken out the game for very, very valid reasons. <laughs> Still taken out the game. You know what I'm saying? Still no longer running the marathon. Oh, and man. so I think. It just goes back to what we were saying earlier about the whole patience aspect of everything. Is I do think that the artists that can make the smart moves um, while staying patient through it all and actually has like you know quality to good music to boot, like uh, those artists I've never seen not win. You know, uh, we always tell telling clients and brand and network members that if you see things working for you then it's usually a matter of when, not if, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so it might take you, going back to what we said earlier, it might take you five years versus another artist two years, but if things are upticking for you and people like it and you, you see real-world proof that people like the music the art- that you're putting out, then it always becomes a matter of when, not if. Now it's up to you as the artist to not fuck everything up before that moment comes along and happens, right? Yeah, exactly. Not quit. Not you know do certain things to sabotage your image or your sound quality or just like not deviate from the game plan that's kind of been moving you along, and so I would go I I think you know lack of patience takes out majority of artists. Yep. We've had clients before that I could tell just started taking their music seriously and then they quit a year later because things didn't move. So I was like, oh, I've been making music for the last. I'm dropping music consistently for the last like seven months and this shit didn't work out. And you're like, bro, it's been seven months, bro. Like you know. This motherfucker right now, right now getting his first half a million streams and he been in this shit for 10 years or some crazy <laughs> shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's just yeah. like, one is just a, um, it's a slap in the face to the artists that do get, mm. that that's the way it works, I think, is whenever artists come along. That's why, like I said earlier, bro, you, you can tell how new an artist is to the game by how fast they think things are supposed to move. Yep. Like most of the artists that have been doing it for a while, like they're usually a lot more patient, like I've learned. Like they, they, they understand like things don't, happen overnight it's not magic like this shit gonna take a while artists that usually don't know shit like don't know a damn thing they don't know a thing I'm gonna be the ones that be like hey man it's been 72 hours and I still ain't got you know XYZ <laughs> like bro like what it's been yeah. 72 hours bro exactly like yeah and they literally be like that yeah just like hours. that what's, what's going on I don't know. yeah now, when will I know if this thing's gonna work three months three months you're like three months bro, that's short bro what you mean yeah. that, that shit gonna fly by man go, go take a nap get you a little a little latte you know what I'm saying <laughs> Find yeah. some shows to binge. Don't even ask questions about it. Shit gonna breeze right on by, man. Come back with some sense. <laughs> yeah, <what> I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, and I, I think, um, I think you, you hit that on a nail too, because I, I remember Miguel had some quote basically saying that he felt like the game is built in a way to test to see how much you want it. Mm. Not just if you're talented enough, but how much you actually want this thing. Mm. Are you gonna stay about it? Go through the hardships, wait out the time, all that that comes with it. Because of course, you know, especially when it comes to the money. Money's not coming. People still got to live that real life at the same time. So are you going to stay with it? You know, so, yeah, man, that's uh, a hell of a point. And I want to switch it to something a little fun, but also <laughs> educational in its own way. Because Cardi B got flamed. They were roasting her for performing in somebody's backyard. And, you know, Cardi B had to learn them. She had to school them. I got paid $1 million to perform at this elite bankers event private event for 400 people for 35 minutes think about that when you type about this grammy winner all right i mean she kind of said what she said you don't need to go much deeper than what she said 
the the clout was there. The clout back the, was there. The, the clout back was there, and to me, it only makes me think about why it still gets me sometimes when fans have these comments and you know on the videos, and they'll be talking about something. It's like you really just don't know how this jump works. No shit. And they talking facts in their head, <laughs> and they telling you, bro, you just got an opinion. And I'm like, no, this is actually a fact. But as long as you think it's an opinion, I can't change that. <laughs> you don't know, you don't understand, bro. I do this shit. But like on the other side, what that makes me think of seriously is an artist funnel. All right. So these days we get sold or artists get sold this idea of having a marketing funnel just like other industries. And a lot of times a part of your funnel might look like, oh, you could do weddings higher ticket events like that. Of course, you got your CD that's cheaper and the vinyls that might be a little bit more expensive, your shows, but then you do something high ticket like a wedding or a private meetup and they're talking about 3K, 5K for that private meetup, which is great for a lot of artists at that level, but zoom out. Artists on this level, that funnel does not leave. It's a legitimate thing. It's just you might not be in a space that you can utilize it yet but boy this is not a new story to me i remember hearing about beyonce getting paid i, I don't remember how many racks for performing and then somewhere in the middle east usher yeah, getting paid like a a, a couple million or Them something kids, 16 yeah. birthday parties exactly and shit. Yeah. exactly stuff like that <laughs> like just little things like that i think beyonce got paid from uber like hella stock oh uh, yeah you know what i mean yeah, yeah. lil wayne actually i saw a clip uh with him probably like yesterday funny enough so he was in Dubai and they were like, yo, you can't come out here. You got all this chains and all this stuff. Whatever reason they didn't want, it, they said he can't do it. All right. He had 25 bands worth of chains on. All right. And Pardon. the Your Highness, you know what I mean, found <laughs> out. And he was like, yo, what the hell going on, man? Oh, like, yeah, y'all yeah, yeah. are embarrassing yeah, me and everything. Yeah. 25000 Oh, yeah, I give you $25,000 or whatever. <laughs> I, I bought him a Lambo, all these things. But that's what type of time a lot of these places are on, right? Let alone whatever he was making from his show money, yeah. right? They're like, yeah, let buddy through. Let buddy through. You know, Dubai moves different. You know, and it's like that oil money is, is 100% different. But the point is. Like you said, just go back to the bar mitzvahs, man. Let's, yeah. let's go back to the King Sietas, man. Let's go back to, to the, the park festival. Yeah, the park festival, the corporate <laughs> events. Yeah. These things pay. And there's so many ways to make money beyond this. And the more special you become within specific crowds, you're able to demand stuff like this. You don't make this money from from Y'all. shows yeah hell no nah. you don't make this even like your your tour nights you got some of these people who got uh, like a, a tour and they might they make multi-millions doing a a tour of official show in a stadium cool one show you might make honestly what there's some people who make like maybe 20 band uh no 20 mil in a show right or am i is it more five I got, i'm trying to do the math yeah there's definitely people who are making multi-millions from one show 20 million is, is a little less, so that's an even higher air. But there's multiple artists that are in a um, position to make five mil from a show, right? Mm. Conversion, everything included. We're talking about one mil for 35 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, that shit is so different. The level of setup is different. The level of people involved in terms of you don't have Ticketmaster taking any money out. Yeah. Like this shit is is ridiculous money when you like bust it down. Like this might be more money than a five million dollar show in, in some cases in terms yeah. of what you take home. Yeah, but and for four hundred people, like that's nothing. For four hundred like, people? Like these are the types of events that artists of that size miss doing anyway, right? Like, oh I wish I could go back to doing a four hundred cap show. But still be able to make as much money as these mm-hmm. twenty, thirty thousand people shows that I do. And like this is the, the sweet spot. Yep. And like the thing I like about this, and I think we've talked about it before, like kind of talking about like the show promoter background, is that there are just some industries that don't understand the value of music and everything else. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing. Yep. Right. Because like you said, any world where this show is controlled by people that understand music. She wasn't. She's not getting a. She wasn't getting a million dollars, right? But like I said, this is a elite private banking event 
these motherfuckers don't know nothing from a fucking stick against the wall. You know what I'm saying? They probably like, oh, I heard of Cardi B. Cardi B's fine. Yeah. We're a banking company, and what's a million dollars? You know what I'm saying? For this artist that we've heard about and, and know is a celebrity or a superstar, right? That's nothing to us because we don't have the same viewpoints and limitations that people in the music industry have. And like I've seen that at smaller levels before. It's just like, like one of the biggest tips I think every artist should follow if they want to get paid booking shows is like go after colleges, right? Yes. If you've ever been an artist that got booked at a college before, yep. you know they will pay you a crazy amount of money that sometimes is worth more than what you really are worth. Oh, but then you, usually it's yeah, worth more yeah. at the college level, yes. Yeah, bro. It's like, oh, oh, you a local artist with whatever, I'll give you 10 bands. You're like, word. All right, great. You know what I'm saying? Because there are these people who have they have these budgets they have to spend. The budget is the budget. Yeah, the budget, the budget got to go. And you no, know, judging from people I've talked to that that control budgets of these corporations, they're like hey, if we don't spend the budget, we we don't get the same budget next year. So yep. we are gonna make sure we spend the budget right, and we get out there. So a lot of these oh, corporate wow. events are like that, bro. It's like hey, we got maybe a three million dollar entertainment budget that we gotta get rid of by the end of the year anyway. Shit, what's giving this Cardi B woman I've heard of before that got a big song, a million dollars? Like, yeah, I think that might be worth it. They don't fucking know her going, yeah. booking rate, you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. if that lines up. So it's like things that you would look at as like a finesse in the music industry will be like nothing in other, if you can figure out how to monetize in other industry, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's what I like about this is like, she's saying like, hey, like, fuck y'all in the music space. You know what I'm saying? These banking people pay me a million dollars for a 30 minute show for 400 people. If I did my own four hundred person show, I would. She would have maybe made like twenty thousand know dollars. You know what I'm saying? Maybe twenty, like fifty thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? With that being said, <laughs> yo, don't let these corporate dollars gas you up and make you feel like who you ain't. Oh, facts. With yeah. The music, like you get yeah. that fifty bands from that corporate check or the commercial or the, or the sync deal in some of these spaces, places, and you're like. Oh yeah, man. This is this is what I'm worth. <laughs> this is what I'm charging. Like, oh, do you, do you have any idea what I'm making over here, bro? Like, you violating me by offering this? No, no, yeah. no, no. With the music, this is your value. Yeah. This is reset. <laughs> you actually think you're doing big money, and I'm not saying this to like talk down on people, but it's like I've seen the egos get inflated, and then you take it back to the regular space and you ruin things mm -hmm. with that new energy. Cause you made fifty k or a hundred k off of some corporate shit, and you're think feeling like you're big money. When for them, he's like, oh yeah, that's like entry level. Yeah, it's like that's it's just a different entry level, yeah. right? Everybody knows in music, hey, the money is tighter in general. So if you're dealing with somebody in the music industry, you're going to get offered less in general. Whether it's a a, a brand deal, a music placement, TikTok is a perfect example, right? You know, you're paying influencer, hey. Even some of them got smart, which I appreciate, where they mm -hmm. have their music yeah. <laughs> prices. This is how much it costs to market music. But then if you're a clothing brand, somebody like this is like 5X that. Because yeah. they understand it's just different. Yeah. All right? So the moment you can understand that, because I, I just talked about artists, but influencers, I should, if y'all out there too, it's the exact same thing. Y'all start getting these other offers and doing a couple commercials. And he's like, I'm not about to do um this influencer post on tiktok for five hundred dollars when this guy just paid me five bands it's like hey well one you got to do content anyway and you're not going to get paid anymore for music in period based on your value now because yeah. of your followers da, 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 da. so one of the most important parts of business is understanding your value where you are and your value changes depending on who you're talking to period you know what i mean you think, oh, you got all this leverage because you got this platform and, you know, I'm I'm Reebok and I can go talk to, let's just say, shoot, a little baby, right? And I got all this value as Reebok, as a business person. I feel like I might have all this value. But if I go from him and then I go talk to Beyonce, that's a different conversation, right? My yeah. value to Beyonce is different than a little baby where he is in his career. Yeah. My value to the little baby and Beyonce is different than where who's new enough. Uh, Jaleel, right? That's a great look for J Jaleel. It's not as big of a look for Beyonce, mm. right? Not as big of a look for. So in the same way, businesses have to understand their value in different spaces and places, depending on who they're talking to at the moment. 
you have to do the same thing. And artists, y'all want most certainly, please do that. Don't let these checks get y'all beside yourselves. But do let that inform you that you should understand what the marketplace looks like in every space that you move in before you start to make decisions. Because you could be doing the opposite, right? And underselling yourself as well. You should be getting 50 bands and they don't have no problem giving you 50 bands and you up there record, uh, you know, <laughs> are cool with asking for 10K. I, yeah. I remember seeing a job, and uh, it was like a job interview and someone got mad because the salary was like 120K, but the person... Like they would go up to that 120k, and the person was like, "Oh yeah, you know, yeah. give me 90k." And they were like, "Okay." It was like, and then people were like, "Well, you should have told them, you know, you're yeah. wrong because you had a 120k budget." It's like, why am I supposed to tell them <laughs> I had 120k? <laughs> they were completely happy with their 90k. <laughs> you know, they were I mean? ecstatic. They were ecstatic. <laughs> you up there making them feel bad about their life, right? <laughs> so you know, messing up their uh, their ignorance and bliss. So. Like it, it's just really valuable, man, to know the um the numbers in every single room you move in, and that might take time when you move in new rooms and spaces. But it's something that you got to do. Yeah, man, gotta know who you understand who you're getting the bag from or trying to get the bag from. Understand, understand. Now, this clip, been waiting to play this clip right here. Your guy, my guy. Me? Many people's What guy. did you post okay. on SoundCloud? <laughs> well, post Malone exposed and how himself, soon do how he blew up. What did you post on SoundCloud? White yes, Iverson. Sir. White Iverson, yes, sir. And how soon do people start listening? Instantly. Like, how old were you? He let me, I was 18, yeah. You graduated high school? Yes, sir. The night it was done, I was like, let's just fucking put it up. What's the worst that could happen? How weird is it that like all of a sudden kids started passing this thing around to the point that you were getting like a million streams in a month. It very much had to do, he's an Atlanta guy named Fat Man Key, and he was there at the studio whenever I dropped it. He was buddies with Wiz. And well, what did Fat Man Key do? You put it up on SoundCloud. He tweeted SoundCloud. it, he, or he oh. sent it to Wiz, and then it just went fucking nuts. And then like all these guys, Waka Flocka, like everything, like people I fucking looked up to for so long were just like, FaceTiming me in the middle of the night and I was like, yo, what the, f like, this shit's crazy. What did you post on SoundCloud? White yes, Iverson. Sir, White Iverson. First yes. and foremost, and how man, soon shout do out people to start listening? Howard Stern for such an innocent question. Yeah. That was just so funny. <laughs> well, what did Fat Man Key do? That was, was that? that was, that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting to see this and we can go like, we can slice this down in so many ways but i remember when post malone was blowing up and you know i think there was some industry plant conversations for by some people around him one, one way or another and my thing that i did have you know i'm not big on the industry plant thing but the thing that i did have was he didn't just post this shit and Wiz Khalifa knew about it within 24 hours. You know what I mean? That didn't make mm. sense to me. Yeah. It's no way I, nobody <laughs> would. Like, I, okay. You could tell me it's the hottest song in the world. It's no way like it works like that. So it's like he had to be connected with somebody, with some people. I didn't know exactly who the people were, um, but I knew that it was more than just, oh, I made a dope song. I threw it up on Twitter, Twitter of all places and the way my rally worked. The, nah. It's like, that didn't make sense. So I'll start with that statement, but I want to hear what you got to say. No, nah, I mean, first off, you know, shout out to Key, bro, because Key, especially with a lot of the SoundCloud artists of that time, he was always like the secret puzzle piece for a lot of them. That I, I always wonder if we only got to hear about it because we were here in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, 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 the information hits the streets a lot faster, but it's like, bro, from like, I mean, now we know Post Malone, so like people like Lil Yachty, Fucking Rico Nasty, Uzi, Trippy Red. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of those like really early like SoundCloud popping rappers, bro. Like he had a hand in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's it's crazy, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like he he been just, he got some some great A and R roots. You know what I'm saying? Or great A and R um, skills. But the second thing I think about with this is it's so funny how like that a lot of things they were doing at that time were just like really early stage influencer campaigns. You know, like that was pretty much like an industry influencer campaign, right? Like he yeah. tweeted it, so Wiz yeah. Khalifa would see it, and then he would tweet it, and it just spread from there. Right. But like they didn't understand it that way back then, because I remember this was around the time when I was managing the rapper I was managing, 
I remember us looking at Post Malone popping and time like damn, like like you said, like how did he do this shit? <laughs> and literally the very next day, all these different celebrities are, are posting it, and then it makes sense. It's like you had this person uh, behind you that knew all these other celebrities and people and influences in the game that could help you spread out. So it looks like it's moving a lot faster, or actually it moved a lot faster than it would have organically if you were kind of doing it on your own. Yep. So, I mean, that probably really just strengthens his industry plant um, argument. <laughs> just, I, I think not from the level that people were thinking of it. People tend to think of the industry plant argument as like, oh, you know, it's this music exec with a lot of money and power helping you out, but like, what if it's just another artist that has a, a lot of other popping artist homies that just like you? You know what I'm saying? He just like how many times have you heard that story? Artist A likes artist B and tells all his friends about artist B, and they all help that artist blow up just because they fuck with him. Does that you know? It's like that. That's what this sounded like to me. You know? Yeah. See, the, and that's the thing. You know, that's part of why I like that industry plant stuff gets my nerves because people. The, what the idea of it is like this super orchestrated thing, mm -hmm. right? Like we're, we're in a room, a dark room with some hoods on, with the map and how we gonna lay this shit out and trick the world. Yeah. And then bam, <laughs> there goes the artist. It's like, it's not that dog. Like there might be, okay, you can connect some dots because there's somebody in the industry that knows this person mm -hmm. and they and then they do some stuff. But also that happens all the time and that just doesn't work out like that, exactly. by, by the way. So right? much of the time. So much, right? <laughs> Most of the time, by and large, not even close. But it goes back to the importance of relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Connections. No matter what, how long you move and how strong you are at what you're doing, you're going to need connections. And I don't even think that's just a music industry thing. If you want to keep leveling up, if you want to keep, um, like, if you want to lessen the amount of money you got to spend, <laughs> you want to improve your ability to stay afloat at the level that you already are, it's just going to be about building connections and knowing people. So, like, that, the more I look at the game and research just and, and get a vibe for different aspects of wealth and and growth in different industries, it's always like, okay, yeah, you know, every the, the smart people just have other people that they can fuck with. Because what they say, hey, if I'm the only rich person, I'm an op. If we all rich, you know what I mean? I got a squad <laughs> with me, right? So that's, I think, one, it, it brings me down that path, but just to simplify it, relationships, man. Yeah. Uh, you can, just knowing some really dope people just really dope people. Don't have to be this this super duper, I'm trying to trick the world type plan. You know a, a couple of dope people. They can get you in places that no one else can get in. Not even being super like um uh, like strategic about it. It's just like, oh yo, homie, like pull up X, Y, and Z, cause y'all are cool. And then all these other people happen to be there because they're your friends and mm -hmm. just like serendipitously, other things happen. A lot of stuff happens like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that. I mean, that's like the the secret part. Well, I guess it's not really secret, but like the hard to quantify skill in the industry, right? Like how yes. how lucky are you, or how often are you able to put yourself in those situations? Um, which is usually much easier to do for artists because artists y'all can always use the whole creativity. You know, what I'm saying I like your art, you like my art thing to get into the room. That I think makes yep. it harder sometimes for like people wanting to be like business professionals. But then on the opposite, I can see sometimes it's easier for us because we have a thing that we can offer. We can be like, hey, like, mm -hmm. invite me here because I can do something for you. It's not, it's not abstract on what I can do for you. Yep. It's, it's very concrete. Um, but I do think that's a very underrated superpower is making friends in the industry, getting yourself in, in, in rooms with certain people, not even just because you think the art itself is going to be super amazing right, or, or groundbreaking, but just because, like, hey, you realize this person has a network that could benefit me in some way, and maybe I also have a network or some skill set that could benefit them in some way. And you know, the industry is small. Like it, it's a lot. What I've learned just going through the music industry is a lot of times people you want to get in contact with really are like one introduction away from somebody that you might already know or kind of know, mm -hmm. right? Um, so then it just becomes about uh, how many friends am I making that are going to vouch for me in front of people that might hear about me from three or four different other spaces. So that way the vouching is a little bit stronger um, and just like my name spreads out a lot quicker, right? Or I, or I get in front of these people who do make these magical moments happen for me a lot faster. Um, so that's how I look at it. But 
I mean, it's dope to see. Like I said, that I think a lot of our, those SoundCloud rappers at the time were getting that industry plant label. Um, when really they just were people that were just made friends with other artists. You know what I'm saying? In some way, shape, or another. And it really, it really was the artists like helping each other pop off. It was, it wasn't really like industry people like that. You know, like I think that was probably around the times where we started to be able to publicly see like artists like clicking up together. You know what I'm saying? Like off the internet and stuff because. Socials were becoming a lot more powerful. You were seeing a lot of SoundCloud artists start to click up and, and things like that. So we got to like see that happen in real time. Like, oh, this artist knows this artist. Now it makes sense on why this artist got this look in Atlanta, right? Like he was cool with this yeah. underground Atlanta rapper this whole time that had you know whatever type of pull out there. So I think that era was when we started to be able to like see it, see the lines because you could you could see them post a picture with somebody. And then go look at everybody tagged in the picture, and you could draw the, the conclusions, right, uh, yeah, and, and, and put sure. the line together. Um, so, for like now, today, I don't think that's not that's not a surprise. Now, it's like it's no surprise to sometimes learn like, oh, this artist was friends with this other artist way before they started popping off. It's like, no, nah, that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Like they got somebody that got you in the game. So, you know, shout out to, to Post Malone for um, being not early because I don't feel like he was he wasn't the first. You know, maybe not early. I don't know the word I'm looking for. Um, Ahead of his his tribe, maybe. <laughs> I don't even know if I can say that. They don't feel right saying it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say there. I don't have any rebuttal and I don't have any <laughs> clarification either. I'm going I'm to just let that one rock. But let's get to, we're going to do this one last one. We might have a, a time for uh other one. But this right here, man. Ah. <sighs> Rappers who changed the rules of the industry. Soldier Boy. Okay. All right. Lil Wayne. Oh, we got shot to pay. Who did this? This is Underground Sound. This is Underground Sound. Yeah, underground Sound. Odd Future. Agreed. Lil Yachty. Agreed. Playboy Cardi. Agreed. Yeet. I think Yeet was a troll. Tell no. me. Don't tell me. <laughs> all these artists are good. Okay, all these artists are good. All these artists have a legitimate fan bases. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. This isn't this isn't the conversation. How did they change the rules of the game? Each of them. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Change the rules who, of the, of the industry specifically. Who, we who know Soldier you, Boy. Who I'm saying. Who are you doubting? Who am I doubting? Yeah, it sounds like somebody, there's a specific person that you doubt in here. Not a specific person, specific people. Okay. Lil Wayne, I think I understand what that argument probably is, right? I, Future, I actually don't fully understand what his change rules of the industry is, right? Love how he moves, moves different, et cetera. So I don't understand. I'm actually, I'm genuinely and un, like trying to figure out what that argument is. Lil Yachty. I knew it. I don't understand. I knew it. Right? Cardi, I actually don't understand. Uh, Yeet, I don't understand. I don't understand most of these in terms of change the rules of the in the rules of the industry. That's a very specific thing, not like who came in doing something different, right, and building like a, like a different image or a fan base and all that stuff. But I could, we already know, you could run down a long list of all the Soldier Boy stuff. Like he broke the internet, like completely different did all the dance stuff da, mm. da, 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 right that's very obvious the cell phone he did a lot of things that's very clear and documented Lil Wayne I think the thing people would go to would be the, the volume. mixtape yeah. the volume, the volume the mixtape, right? yeah. so I know what that is right I don't know what it is with, with, that they're referring to here with with Tyler do you know I think with Tyler our future in general were very early to like milking the social media wave. You know what they did say? I right, future, not Tyler. That's mm -hmm. probably what I because I was stuck on the image of Tyler. Mm. I can all right. I, I can see. Yeah. I, uh, like, yes. Like I, them I, as a collector, bro. The vlogs, the different like yes. entertaining stuff. Like they were heavy to socials, and I think also they're probably the most current, non mainstream adjacent artists to be as big as mainstream adjacent artists. You know, it's like we mm -hmm. haven't had an artist that. Looks like Tyler, you know what I'm saying, stands out like Tyler from a general, like it's a mainstream perspective that's been able to be bigger than, if not bigger than a lot of the mainstream artists, right? right. So I think that in itself kind of like showed a different, a whole generation of artists that didn't look like that. Like, oh, I could be just as successful as the artists that tip, that look like the typical industry person, right? Or, or, or industry artist. And, and black kids who weren't moving like 
quote unquote black kids yeah, should be moving at that time. Yeah, right? exactly, bro. Like, no. Our future made it a safe space for all all black kids out there. Right, you right, know what right, I'm saying? Right. Like so so I, I would say that they're kinda changing in a sense. Who's who's the next one? It was a hell of a prediction. The future would be odd. That's, 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 <laughs> that's where we're going with it. Lil Yachty. Lil Yachty. Hmm. Where do I start with with King Boat? <laughs> Man. I think uh, all right, so I think Lil Yachty's another one we have to give flowers to for how how he milked the internet really early on. He 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 will he called a viral moment. You know what I'm saying? He milking the internet early on is not changing the rules of the industry. Though. Of the current industry at the time, they other artists weren't. Other artists were afraid to be a joke at the time. He wasn't. Is that where we're going? With? It was him. Who else was coming up at the same time? Him, Uzi, Trippy Red, Cardi. Because what he owned that. I think, I think he owns his business so. stuff and moving different. Like I think once I've seen him own his brand and being so brand focused and knowing how to manipulate that. Mm. Right? I don't know. Rules of the industry is just like and he started the whole historical like historical to me. He started the whole like bubblegum trap. You know what I'm saying? Genre thing, which led to Rico nasty and all her Rico nastiness. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and all the little the offset people that came from that. Okay. Yachty is at this point a, a, a he's offspring. He's a he's a he's a great uncle to a lot of like rappers coming up. I now. agree. Yeah, you know? I agree that he that he has a, a tree, you know. Um, and then Cardi. I I ain't really got an answer for you there. I think <laughs> I on. think I think I understand because Cardi doesn't do a lot and does a lot at the same time. Mm-hmm. He almost had. He's almost like the NBA YoungBoy anomaly, where it's like. On paper, you don't understand why their audience is as big, but then like once you see it, you're like, oh no, this shit is, this shit is crazy, right? Like I've, I seen him play with Cardi perform at Rolling Loud, bro. And that shit was terrifying. That shit was scary. <laughs> I ain't even gonna lie, bro. It's just like crowds of mosh pits everywhere. He just running around on stage screaming, making noises. He didn't really rap. He's like, ah, 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 and then just <laughs> everybody lit, bro. So it's like to see that and to be like, damn, bro, like. It's like 30,000 people in this crowd. You know what I'm saying? Like, this shit crazy. So, I don't really completely understand what the argument would be for Cardi changing the industry. I would love for anybody that has a great point to leave it in the comments. Yes. Um, please. I would love to know your thoughts. But I I can get why he maybe would be, maybe be one musically, but not like industry changing. Unless they're talking about like sound, then I would get. Because there are a lot of artists who were birthed from the Kari tree, you know? They have the Kari sound. Let's like, see. yeet. Let's see this right here, man. Because we're going we're gonna to go through some of these comments real quick and do it that way. Because there, there are some people who have some words in the comments and their own feelings, and that might help us along, along the way. Because I am legit. I just feel like there's a difference between being different and doing something, being dope and successful, and changing the rules. Like, people now have to do shit different. Like, the shit that Taylor Swift did, the re-recording, that changed the rules yeah, literally yeah, on yeah. paper. You yeah. know what I mean? So, it's like, what do we mean by changing the rules or just somebody who came in and did some dope shit and they kind of did it their own way? Doing it your own way yeah. is a whole different thing. That's why I feel like they, they, like, they mixed up the meanings. Like, it's one half, like, actual change the rules of the industry and the other half just change, like, the, the musical landscape, like, right. the sound of it. Right. Which, to me, is two different things. Cause Soulja Boy changed rules of the industry. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, like right. the whole ringtone thing changed yep. shit. The, he was the first to the internet. Wayne changed the industry. He made a volume strategy very, made it very. Cool. Yeah, made it cool, right? Um, and like, hey, I'm just gonna pump out a bunch of shit, and then everybody wants to pump out a bunch of shit. So like, yeah, those people I, I do see. Some of the others, I think, are more like musical landscape. Yep. Changed a Replace little bit. Replace Yeet with X. See, and that's another thing. Yeet is just too damn early to even say he nah, changed the rules. Yeah, I think, like, I think he's a troll, bro. Yeah. Underground sound, he be doing shit like this sometimes, right. bro. He just be fucking with his audience. Yeah. And I, I genuinely think that one has to be him fucking with his I audience. I do, yeah. I was <laughs> like, I, I know a lot of these things are designed for, you know, commentary, which is what we're doing. So, yeah, bro. congrats on that. 3 6 Mavia. Okay. Yay, future young thug. See, you just, y'all just naming people y'all like, bro. I, mm, I, 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 I would, I would give, I would give you on this, but I I'm see, not that's saying what... young thug should definitely be on there, but I'm not even saying that these people aren't dope or nobody on this list change it. But like, bro, come, you think everybody just change, but on no, here change no, the industry? That's what I'm saying. I, I, I think their argument is musical landscape of the industry, and then our argument is like the actual industry, like the way. Like you changed the way, like you did something that made it, that made every artist after you have to move differently. Yes, that, yeah. that's a, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Which like, yeah, like, I don't think, 
many of them, especially no. not that comment, did it. That's no. what I'm saying. Yeah. You, know, you know, people just be hearing what they want to hear. It's like when uh, the 2000s trash argument. Nobody heard it. I was talking about the whole music industry, business side, music yeah. side, <laughs> investment, the whole product. It was just, oh, I'm going to just name... What you mean? You don't know nothing about them? Uh, young Jock, T.I., da da da. I was like, okay, y'all are just proving my <laughs> point, basically, talking about artists that I damn near reference in the video so they don't add to the argument. Yeet doesn't deserve to be up there yet. Where's ASAP Mob? ASAP Rocky was the first artist after Soldier Boy that got big all on his own over the internet. Uh, that's not completely true because yeah. that would completely discredit uh, Future right above them. Uh, future. Yeah, are we gonna count Lil Lil B? Are we? I mean, he did his own thing. He <laughs> definitely changed some shit, bro. And he was he, he want to talk about some troll and leveraging like that whole curse thing that he had going on. Was I mean, whole, yeah, that was a whole different. That was a mega branding way, bro. I still don't quite understand how he built what he built, like yeah. the way he did it. That that shit was interesting. I don't get it either, but I got this one homie that's a huge Lil B fan, bro. Like to the point where it's kind of annoying. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't get it sometimes. Oh man, let's see if we can find somebody else. Uh, that's one of the weird comments where people come out. And now they mention Lil B. Actually, that's funny as fuck. Where this one? Yes, bro. That long ass comment. Look at it. Oh damn, they did. I've been blessed with your absolutely spot on content about the hip hop genre. More so, I'm appalled by the decisions of yours, not including the rapper who goes by the name of Lil B. What are the fucking odds? That's crazy, bro. <laughs> see, that would be the weird ass <laughs> comment, wouldn't it? All right, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed another rapper who goes by the name of Young Thug, also known as Jeffrey, was also been excluded. <laughs> I hope you fix your grave mistake as soon as possible. Fine guy, have a okay. Now it makes more sense. Look, honestly, all I saw was fine guy and hashtag free sex, and I was like, oh, it's one of those weirdos again. But now, okay, you talking about the Young Thug? Okay, he ain't really done too much. Gucci Future, Thug and Chief Keep Cardi B instead of Yee. It should be no, I don't want to see nothing that talks about Yee. We are get hear that and get that. Uno, who's Uno? Not Got that. to be Young Thug. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, future, future. yeah, see, people just naming folks. Yeah, bro. People just start naming that's why I hate these arguments, but people just start naming artists that they like that other artists kind of sound like. And like I said, bro, like we go back to the core, which I wish underground sound, if y'all are hearing this, I, I wish I had specified that. Yeah, like change the rules of the industry or change the sound of it because yeah, there are some of them like yeah, bro, like so like like Soulja Boy, Wayne, bro, they, they artists out there had to move differently. It changed everybody's release strategy, everybody's promo strategy, everybody's marketing yes. strategy. When you come in as an artist and you, you your decision impacts the way your peers have to make their decisions, you have a different place in music history, Excellent. right? And like every artist doesn't get to do that. It's cool, I think, when you are one that gets to do that, but. Yeah, no, nah, I think I wish I had specified because some of them, especially a lot of those ones in the comments, and we go back. So we already said it, bro. Fans don't know shit. I can't, I can, I can take, I can't take a fan hot take seriously sometimes when it comes to things like this. But, 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 you know, there were some I do think could be argued for. Yeah, you know, yeah. In, in the right circumstances. Uh, yeah, look, man, I already <laughs> made the mental decision. I'm trying to avoid any of those types of arguments because all the videos we've done, like where we talk about the. Oh, that be on you. That be, that be I, on me. I don't mind people getting <laughs> on me. It's just that people don't be understanding shit. I'm just like, man, these arguments. They don't, they don't, the videos look the, the videos don't perform. A, the videos go crazy viral. Shit, I do them all day. I'm like, this ain't even a viral video. We weren't even trying to like troll, and then y'all just don't get it. This shit don't even make. It's ain't even worth it, bro. Because <laughs> you got people giving all their opinions. And it's not even addressing the criteria that we're talking about. That's my thing. It's like, stick to the criteria. Stick to the criteria. Like, oh, hey, bro. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not for those. But this last thing, we're going to get this out of the way because we've been trying to get it out of the way for a minute. So then we can get it off our brains. This InstaFest app or website, if y'all have seen this, check it out. I mean, if y'all haven't seen this, check it out for sure. Let me put it on the bigger screen. Um, but basically, all you got to do is sign in with your Spotify. You, now now they allow you to do it with Apple Music and, and Last FM. I'm saying Last FM. That's random as well. I, I didn't think they were moving <laughs> like that where you'd be inspired to do any tech work for Last FM. But <laughs> you do that, and they're going to create one of these dope flyers with you basically saying the type of artist you should be on a festival flyer with. So, hey, a lot of times we ask people when we're trying to help them with their marketing, hey, who would you be on a festival with? Who would you be on a playlist with? Well, you use this little app right here. 
from signing in, and you can get a vibe of what things could look like. And honestly, I like the strategic usage of it. Usage of it. They might just use the um, the fans also like right. That might be direct, but especially I'm not aware yet if they pull like any extra data. Yeah, like, it's funny. Your, it's funny your top string artists, like your top string artists. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's the one. So all right, I, I think I'm I'm getting confused. And this actually means the show that you would go to, not related to your music. Yeah, exactly. So like, uh, if, so like me as a listener, it's gonna make a, a festival lineup based off of my top stream uh, artist. Oh, okay, um, that is different. Yeah. So like, if you go through the sound, I don't know if you got the controversy on Spotify on here to look mm. at it, but like it, that's what I use it. Oh yeah. So yeah, if you like run through it. Then it just yeah it, it'll ask you like there we go you want your top artists from the last four weeks last six months all the time pick a style and then and then it makes it so all right this is my Ron Weiss by the way these are, these are, <laughs> these are not my artists except Steve Lacey I know she don't listen to Steve Lacey that's probably because I'd be listening to the profile and Toby Lou those two are probably me let me see behind me okay okay so it's it's still a dope feature to check out and honestly. Once I found out for sure that this wasn't a Spotify app, I was just like, oh, okay, they they finessing to get Spotify data. Because, you know, Spotify is real tough about that data they mm-hmm. let you get. So, hey, man, if, if you want to figure out how to extract your Spotify data, you might need to figure out how to do something like this right here. Yeah, I even know what they're using it for. Because apparently the the girl that created it is just like a, like a college student. She's like a 20-year-old college student. Oh, of course. She made this. It went viral. And then, of course. you know. Memphis. So it doesn't seem like there's any like intent not yet behind it. Yeah, exactly. They, do, they yeah. take the purity and they figure <laughs> out. <laughs> but from an artist standpoint, because you said something, at least in the terms of like the audience building, if you were getting tagged in these by from fans, you should 100 percent be writing down every artist that's on that flyer with you. Yes, because these are artists that you might want to target in your marketing campaigns, right? If I'm if I'm in this situation, Drake. Trying to get some new fans, I might have to run some ads to, to Lucky Day and Beyonce, right? Because I can see like, hey, if Sean's girl listens to these people and listens to me, so you know maybe she's a representative of of another ideal fan. So that's what I would do. Like I would, if I was Drake, I'll be writing down every artist um, in a fan flyer that I get tagged in, and then be like, okay, these artists, I'm gonna do a little research on. And maybe make them a part of my my targeting options for whatever type of marketing I'm doing or whatever my campaign looks like. That's that's what I'll be using this for. Facts. Yeah. Facts. Well, that is it for today's show, y'all. Of course, as we say, Tuesdays, Thursdays, be on the lookout. We we coming strong. And we haven't failed y'all since we started. So, you know. A little yeah, appreciation for that, that, I feel like that deserves a like and a, and a subscribe. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? There we go. Just Maybe a comment. Maybe a comment. <laughs> Maybe a comment. Give us all that. Once again, this is episode 12 of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brandon Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are out.